Welcome to a Bloomberg Market Special Report, The Fed Decides. We're on Bloomberg Television and Radio. From Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York, I'm Scarlett Fu, along with Tom Keen and Michael McKee. We are just one hour away from the FOMC's June decision, where the Fed is expected to leave interest rates unchanged. So, guys, you've been up since 4 a.m. I know you've been all wrapped up, well, excited. What's my, your first thought? My first thought is, Mike, we get to do this July 27th, September 21, <laughs> November 2nd, and then I guess it's a dead meeting December 14th. Well, you know, it was fascinating. Two weeks ago, this was a live meeting and Brexit was dead. Mm. You know, you know what my first thought is? We got a great set of guests. We do. We, we have, have Ellen Zender, really we have Richard Clarido, we have Alan Blinder, all of that coming up. My first thought, of course, is that it goes way beyond the Federal Reserve, because don't forget, you have overnight the Swiss National Bank, which you pointed out, the Bank of Japan, and of course, tomorrow morning, the Bank of England as well. They're all waiting in the wings to see what the Fed does and says. And because the Fed is sort of the key currency, we're going to see a lot of interest rate differentials. My first thought is it's not about the what, because we know what they're going to do is basically nothing. It's about the why. How do they explain it? Yeah. Do they say that the data that we have seen, and we have seen some disappointing data lately, mean that the economy is going into a slowdown, or is it just a blip? And how they explain that and what their view going forward yeah. is is going to matter a lot. Mine's linked into Scarlett's observation and other banks. Mine is simply the world will be watching. There's no question about that. I agree with you, Mike. Not a big deal, but everybody will be watching around the world. She is central banker to the world. Well, she is central banker, and the man who was in competition to her uh, to be the central banker of the world, Larry Summers, you are has full just of gossip published today. a new article That's old gossip. calling on the Fed to keep rates the same and to raise their inflation target. He says the Fed's making the same mistake that they make over and over again. He thinks that if you're raising rates somehow to help the economy prepare to be sound countercyclical, to have some room to cut, uh, you are confused. Given lags, raising rates now would increase the chances of recession along with the likely severity raising in Inflation and inflation expectations yeah. best prevents and alleviates My recession. comment here, Scarlett, that's so important is Lawrence Summers on the same page with Ellen Zentner. Mm. The call of market economics was Zentner saying, wait, wait, wait till you see the growth, which is basically what we hear from Secretary Summers. And, of course, the challenge of actually raising inflation. And raising inflation expectations has been difficult enough with commodity prices tanking. Raising inflation is a, is a challenge that none of the central banks can seem to get. Well, Larry says what you do is you set a higher inflation target and that will help pull inflation up because it raises mm -hmm. inflation expectations. Let's set the scene now. Equities, bonds, currencies, commodities. Let's get right through this. As Mike said, maybe not all that much within the statement, but the press conference you may see market moves. A two-year yield was a 0.69, and then up we went, down we went. We had a little bit of a higher yield in the last two hours. Ten-year yield, 1.60 percent. And oil has been soggy. I'm not sure how much that's related to the festivities that we'll see this afternoon. On to the next screen. Now, this is a screen that's a little more malleable. This is stuff that will move off any mood. The dollar index is a blended major trading partner index, about 57 percent, the euro, 94.76. That's just a benchmark. But Scarlett, of all this data, the one that I really would watch within the nuances of what we see with the announcement is a 210 spread. Yes. We've had curve flattening the last two days. 87 beeps is not a recession indicator, but nevertheless, that vector is in that direction. I'm going to keep an eye on dollar yen because the yen's been strengthening for four yeah. straight days now. And of course, the Bank of Japan is waiting in the wings, ready to do <clears> something <throat> if necessary. Does it intervene? That's one of the big parlor questions out there. Yeah, Mike, what do we see from China overnight? Did Probably nothing. I mean, yeah. their data dependent on their own data, and they're not yeah. as dependent on the Fed. They have moved the yuan in anticipation of the Fed, <clears throat> but if they're going to be on hold, there's no need for them to do it. And lot. quickly, Scott, as an emerging market proxy, dollar Mexico the last four yes. or five days has really weakened out near record weakness. I'm not sure quite what that means. Will it move off this announcement? I'm not sure of that, but nevertheless, as an emerging market proxy, it's been weaker. All right. In the meantime, let's get a check on the Bloomberg First Word News this afternoon. Sherry Ann has more from our newsroom. Sherry? Thank you, Scarlett. Orlando's mayor says the shooter's threat that he has strapped explosives onto hostages delayed by a significant time, sending paramedics into the nightclub. Orlando Mayor Buddy Dyer says the shooter told negotiators he was strapping explosive vests onto four hostages. Dyer says the shooter was also driving around the Orlando area the night before the massacre. 
Most Americans, 51 percent, disapprove of Donald Trump's response to the deadly mass shooting in Orlando. 25 percent approve. That's according to a CBS News poll released today, and 62 percent oppose his plans to temporarily ban Muslims from entering the U.S. As for Hillary Clinton, 36 percent approve of her response, while 34 percent oppose it, but 30 percent were unaware of her response. Authorities in Florida say a child snatched off the shore and dragged underwater by an alligator is presumed dead, while Disney officials have closed beaches at the company's resorts today as dozens of rescuers search a lagoon for the remains of the two-year-old boy. The attack occurred last night outside Orlando, Florida, in a beach area that's part of the Grand Floridian Resort. And right now on Capitol Hill, Senate Democrats are filibustering over inaction on gun control. Connecticut Democrat Chris Murphy is currently speaking on the floor. He did allow fellow Senator Richard Blumenthal to interrupt him so that he could talk about gun control. Murphy says he is backing Democratic proposals to close a loophole that allows terror suspects to buy guns. A flotilla of boats sailed up the River Thames to the House of Parliament. It's part of a campaign backing Britain's exit from the European Union. UK Independence Party leader Nigel Farage joined one of some 30 vessels protesting EU fishing policies. Farage's vessel was greeted by boats carrying Remain supporters, including rock star philanthropist Bob Geldof. And Global News 24 hours a day, powered by over 2,400 journalists in more than 150 news bureaus around the world. I'm Sherry Ann. Sherry, sure, thanks so much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, rather. Welcome to our coverage on television and Bloomberg Radio Worldwide of this Fed meeting. Michael McKee and Scarlett Fu, and of course, with a esteemed set of guests for conversation as we go to the meeting. And then, Mike, what time's the press conference? 2.30? 2.30, 2 Wall Street time. 2.30, Wall Street time, and then we'll move on from there. How do we get started? Let's get started with someone who has made the market call of the year among major houses. I think of Steve Major at HSBC with his 150 tenure. How about Ellen Zentner, who said, no, the growth's not there, and this is a Fed that will wait. She's been almost perfect, uh, just absolutely fabulous on saying this is a Fed that will wait and wait. Ellen, congratulations on your call. And let me just simply say, when will we see the rate increase that you've said we're going to wait for? Do we see it this year? Uh, we've, we're still sticking to a call that the Fed does get a rate hike in this year, Tom, but we think again in an eerie repeat of last year, they're able to deliver that in December. Uh, these are monetary policymakers that are not ready to throw in the towel yet. In fact, I think today in the, in the uh, statement and in the accompanying so-called dot plot, we see that they still are determined to get two rate hikes right. in this year. Uh, whether they can actually deliver that or not is the real question. We don't think they can, uh, but they're going to want to. There's enough to drive optimism in the second half of the year if you're a policymaker, and I think they're going to continue to hold on to that hope that growth does improve in the second half. Well, plenty of dot pot analysis with Michael McKee. Mike, here's a quote from Zentner I liked, and why don't you jump in with Ellen? Uh, let's bring up the quote to me, if you would. And the basic idea here is the longer run dynamics. You think of short term, medium term, and longer run. No doubt the dispersion of those dots, the McKee dots, will shift somewhat more dovish. We expect new assessments to result in sweeping, Mike, sweeping changes to potential growth in the longer run normal e nominal equilibrium rate of interest. Mike, the word sweeping catches me from Ms. Zentner. Well, it uh, has been a big change in the way we think about how fast the economy can grow. And Ellen, uh, right now, Janet Yellen has said she doesn't understand why we can't grow faster because it all revolves around productivity and the fact that productivity has just sort of gone away. We know the labor market is shrinking, but until you get some sort of increase in productivity, how do you get a higher potential growth rate? Exactly. And productivity has been a big thorn in the Fed's side. Um, and it's productivity that they often point to when they talk about, we don't know if equilibrium rates will pick up. These persistent headwinds were expected to fade, and they haven't faded. Uh, and so if you're a policymaker, you have to start questioning your end game, the, the point that you can raise rates to and how quickly you can get there. And I think that we've seen enough policymakers give these kinds of remarks publicly that we're expecting that to show up in those 
dots in the out years. So while we don't think the story in today's statement will be in the dots coming down for 2016, we think the real story will be what they do in the out years, uh, providing at least a somewhat more realistic path, although it's still not going to be seen as uh, by the markets as realistic. Well, I guess the, to support the dot chart, the question is going to be, why are we seeing the decline that we have in labor markets and in inflation expectations? You take a look at the chart of what's happened over the last couple of months, and a data-dependent Fed has no particular reason for uh, it to raise rates at this point. Uh, I would agree. There is no compelling reason for this Fed to raise rates further at this point. Uh, jobs growth has slowed. Um, there's a big question mark around that May employment report, and we need more data points to be sure that this is not just job growth moving into a slower channel, which would be typical in the late cycle, late phase of the business cycle, or is it the beginning of a precipitous drop that we see leading up to recessions? Anytime there's a question mark around the data, the Fed sits on its hands. It needs more data points. And this is why we think they don't move on rates this summer, certainly. I would put the probability of a July rate hike at extremely low. I'll never say zero. They've surprised us before. But I would put it at extremely low. Uh, and why is job growth slowing? Janet Yellen has said it. She's worried about profits. We've come through five straight quarters of companies reporting declining earnings. Uh, and that's unsustainable, right? If you're bleeding money, you don't hire more. Uh, and that's what, why we think we're seeing the slowdown in jobs. But how big of a slowdown is the question, and we just need more data. Are we at full employment, Ellen? And if so, does the Fed acknowledge that or at least hint at that? Well, I think that, uh, you know, uh, Scarlett's a great question, because many policymakers are showing us that they think we're at full employment. But if that's so, why have we not seen the bigger acceleration in wage growth that you would expect to see? Instead, we've seen just a slow bleed upward. Janet Yellen herself has admitted perhaps the natural rate of unemployment is much lower than where we think it is. In fact, if I think back 10, 15 years ago, uh, sitting uh, in a, at a venue where she gave a speech, uh, and she said, I buy into the idea of this natural rate of unemployment, but I also admit that we don't really know where it is. And so in real time, let's just gauge wage growth. If it's accelerating, we must be close. And so I think, you know, I, I, I hear her. Uh, potential growth of the economy, natural rate of uh, unemployment, where the equilibrium rate of interest rates are, those are extremely difficult measures uh, to get at, especially in real time. And every policymaker right. differs on where they think those are. Ellen Zentner with us uh, here for a bit with Morgan Stanley. Again, Richard Claret and Alan Blinder coming up as well. Um, looking at the market, it's, it's, it's a churn here with a 160 tenure, Scarlett. All right. Meantime, and next up in our special report, we'll be examining the dot plot. The dots. Are we still on track for two rate increases this year? Will forecasts for where interest rates are headed change with the recent softness in data? More of the Fed decides on Bloomberg Television and Radio coming up.
This is a special report. The Fed decides on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm Michael McKee. Well, it is perhaps the centerpiece of the Fed's decision today. It's the dot chart. And we want to go over what that actually is and why it is so important. The Fed, a couple of years ago, started putting out, with its economic forecasts, the level of the Fed funds rate that the members of the Open Market Committee thought would be appropriate for their economic forecasts. Unfortunately, Wall Street has taken that as a prediction. It's the law of unintended consequences. So what you end up with is dots that represent what the Fed thinks might be and the market thinks it should be. And you can see the path they have here to the terminal rate at the end, to the highest that they're going to go, is much, much steeper than what the market thinks. They're still expecting at least two rate increases. This is three priced in here for the end of 2016. This is what the market thinks is going to happen, which becomes very important when you get all the way out of here. The Fed thinks you're going to get to about 3.5%. The market thinks you're going to get to about 75 basis points. And so for Janet Yellen today, in her news conference, it's going to be all about this gap. Janet, explain this. Why is the Fed still so much more optimistic about where interest rates will go than the market is? And of course, you can see all of that on Dots Go on the Bloomberg. Still with us right now is Ellen Zentner, Chief U.S. Economist at Morgan Stanley. Mike did a, a fantastic job giving us the outlook here for the Dots, or what the Fed thinks uh, interest rates will look like in the coming years. The Dot plot has come under a lot of criticism. Even St. Louis Fed President James Bullard has openly questioned the exercise. Ellen, what is the value of the Dots to you? I think the, the dot plot was very valuable when it was introduced because it's, it convinced markets or it put the money where the mouth is of the Fed saying, we're not going to raise rates for a long time time. Um, and it was very necessary at that time. The unfortunate thing for the Fed is the way this works as a body is once something's introduced, it's very difficult to take it away. Uh, and once they started on the path of hiking rates, it becomes nearly useless. Uh, and many policymakers have admitted that, not just James Bullard. But nevertheless, it's here. So what do we do with it? The Fed actually now can use it as a communication tool around anchoring the long end or anchoring expectations around the, the uh, eventual path, full path of policy. Uh, and we think that that's where they can be most efficacious in today's meeting, by bringing those dots down uh, in 2017, 2018, bringing that longer run dot further down. Uh, and so, and then that's where they can bridge the gap. Mike mentioned the, the expectations gap, the, Fed, the, the market only pricing one rate hike in every year for the next five years, which itself is very unrealistic, but the Fed pricing it, uh, showing us that they're going to hike rates four times next year, four and a half times in 2018, which is also very unrealistic. So there's more scope to close that, compress that gap so that the Fed can start to see more eye to eye with the market. That's what I think people will be focused on uh, today. But unfortunately, the dot plot is, is here to stay. And so really, the Fed has to hone its communication around it. Janet Yellen has the opportunity to do that in the Q&A. Well, it sounds like for you and for people who are trading, the most important thing is to bring the terminal rate down, the one that's all the way to the right hand side of the dot plot, because that would suggest how fast they're going to move rates up, which is maybe more important than how many times it takes them to get there. Exactly, Mike. So it just shows it would it would the Fed would be providing that olive branch to the market saying, hey, look, we're not tone deaf. We're not just going to motor through with rate, rate hikes till we get to this end game, which, of course, the markets are going to continually price in that that's a wrong policy move that results in recession. Uh, and so it, it, there's a lot more room for the Fed to do there. Right. Uh, that said, I still think people will watch the uh, the path for this year, um, you know, I want to say it'll be unexciting because the median will stay at two rate hikes. But hey, we've got what, whom we think is Brainerd at one rate hike. Who joins her? Is it Evans or does Brainerd move her dot from 2016 to 2017? I think there could be some interesting discussion there, uh, even if the right. median, as we expect, stays at two for this year. I think your dot plots are like smoke signals. Ellen, let's look at the real economy at right now. Michael Darda publishing moments ago says they're nuts to raise, and Darda makes real clear with MKM Partners that bad business loans, business loan delinquencies are on the upswing. Let me combine that, Ellen, with something you know quite well over on the Bloomberg Terminal, with recession showing 
Capacity utilization is rolling over way off the 40, 50 year trend. For those of you on Bloomberg Radio, all you gotta know is CapU uh, is the pulse of manufacturing. Ellen, it's rolling over. What does that signal to you about the confidence we can have in decent GDP? Well, guess what, Tom? Earlier this year, we were all pointing to uh, the fact that a lot of this weakness in the manufacturing sector was led by energy. Um, but guess what? It turns out that you can't have a 20 percent rise in your uh, dollar, in the dollar, um, and escape that. And here it is, showing up in the data. So even if you set aside the effects of, of energy investment um, and the drag that lower oil prices have had on that, we've seen business investment profits earnings weaken more broadly uh, across the board, and that's what's showing up in the manufacturing right. data now. Um, and that is a, a worrisome trend. Now, there are other broad indicators in the economy that are still growing, that have shown no signs of a peak, and that are important, as you know, when the NBER, the official arbiter yeah. of recessions, takes a look at the economy to see are we approaching recession. Um, but certainly, uh, the manufacturing data is not good. Um, and that would tell you that, okay, we've yeah, well, got a nice rebound going on in Q2 <clears throat> led by the consumer, but the, the poor investment numbers have not changed. Yeah, and there's a dynamic there that folds into it away from uh, the hieroglyphics of the dot plot. Scarlett, I put this chart as we'll put all of our charts out on Bloomberg Radio Plus. All right, shameless our radio listeners there. worldwide. For our Radio Plus. Ellen Zentner, you're staying with us, Chief U.S. Economist at Morgan Stanley. We have much more coming up on Bloomberg Television and Radio. We're less than 40 minutes away from the Fed's June decision, a quick programming reminder that you can tune in to Bloomberg Radio anywhere around the world really? and also on Sirius XM. Accounting, tax, advisory. Report. The Fed decides on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm Scarlett Fu here with Tom Keen and Michael McKee. I'm taking a look at the stress and how it's returned to the global financial markets in a big way over the past week. Uh, what we have is the uh, Bank of America Merrill Lynch Global Financial Stress Index and how it's really rocketed higher, up 126 percent in four days, the most since the last August, now at its highest since late February. The VIX and the Move Index, which uh, measures volatility in treasuries, have similarly climbed, but they have both eased. So there's a lot more stress in markets. Ellen Zentner, chief U.S. economist at Morgan Stanley, to what extent does the Federal Reserve acknowledge the disruption that we've seen in markets, whether it's from China concerns, whether it's from Brexit? 
Well, it's a good question, Scarlett, because the Fed in general does not react well to late breaking news. And so we have to ask ourselves, in terms of what to expect out of the statement or the tone uh, of, the, of the statement, we can use Janet Yellen's uh, June 6 speech as a guide, where she acknowledged that financial conditions had eased when you compare them to the, the conditions that were in place at the prior meetings this year, um, that we've got a, a rebound in, in economic growth that's underway, driven by the consumer, but that there are lingering worries like uh, uh, financial, like international developments like Brexit and slower job growth. And so I don't think that in the statement we get something that makes it sound like financial conditions have really ratcheted tighter, because that's only been in the last few days when markets have woken up and said, hey, well, Brexit is a real possibility. What we, what we can get is that she shades it more on the worried side in the Q&A. Um, so we pick up more of the late breaking news there in the Q&A. I think what this does underscore, uh, because the Fed always likes to wait to see how these tighter financial conditions eventually feed through to the economy and the outlook, is that this shuts the door on a July rate hike as right. well, regardless of the Brexit outcome. Well, Brett, uh, it's interesting because we are seeing global financial stress go up. A lot of that is Brexit. But in the United States, the St. Louis Federal Financial Stress Index is, has come down a little bit. Right. Uh, least, people are more somewhere. sanguine because they don't think the Fed is going to be raising rates. If the Fed were to cross them up or come out with a hawkish statement, we could see that change. Exactly. The, the communication itself could cause t conditions to tighten. Ellen Zentner, Chief U.S. Economist at Morgan Stanley, stays with us. This is our special report, The Fed Decides. This is a special report. The Fed decides on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm Scarlett Fu, along with Tom Keen and Michael McKee. 
Let's get you started with a check of uh, what's going on in the markets right now. We do have the down the S&P slightly higher gains of a quarter of 1%. The Nasdaq up by a third of 1%. And Tom, you're looking at the two-year, which right now is flat, flat, flat. Yeah, look at the two-year. But what's interesting is how ugly we closed in Europe. I know we're going to do a foreign section here. And that's appropriate, Scarlett, because I got the Swiss 20-year at a negative 0.115. All you need to know is it closed ugly in Europe. Now, maybe that's some of that has to do with two chancellors on stage today and Darling and Osborne. But the fact is this data screen, Mike, this time around is different than most Fed meetings. Well, unfortunately, the Prime Minister, uh, Prime Minister Cameron, did not consult the central bank calendar around the world. I know. He, How dare he? Uh, set the referendum because it's a week after the Swiss meet. It's a week after the Claritas, Fed meet. Claritas. It would help if we knew what they were going to do. Clarida would have straightened about his chancellor. All right. Well, let's stay with this idea of Brexit because a big cloud is certainly hanging over the financial markets. Will the U.K. stay? Will it go? Two top investors have weighed in. You've got legendary short seller Jim Chanos. He told me yesterday in an exclusive interview that he doesn't bother trying to predict the outcome, but he does look at where the bets are being placed. Right now, uh, Brexit in the betting markets is 65-35 to stay. It had been as high as 75-80% to stay. So it has come in, but it's still basically, if you're a betting person, it's two to one to stay. It's not 50-50. Meanwhile, bond investor Jeff Goodlock says, quote, I believe that leave is over pull polling. It's punching above its weight class. When it comes up for a vote, I think it will fail. So Goodlock making a call there on a remain. So uh, when you look at it, Tom, and you look at pound, of course, cable has been all over yeah. the place the last couple of weeks. This is a chart I haven't shown in a million years of the Bloomberg. Michael, wander in on this, if you would. This is sterling, and all you need to know is on the Z-axis, we do the Z-axis. The Z-axis well. specials. I got a ball here in Columbia blue a 40. I've never, ever, ever seen that. And Francine Lacroix had this brilliantly showing sterling volatility uh, this morning. That uh, means we should bring in Richard Clarida, formerly dean of uh, economics at the Columbia uh, Business School, uh, rather Columbia University, and now, of course, global strategic advisor at PIMCO. And we continue with Ellen Zetner of Morgan Stanley, who's been dead on about a Fed that would de uh, delay. Professor Clarida, I know you're going to tell me that we should ignore Brexit. I'm sorry, Janet Yellen is not going to ignore Brexit. But with that, how does she fold that into her Federal Reserve mandate? Well, that's a great point, and I, and I don't think she should ignore Brexit. Obviously, you know, the Fed takes into account global uh, developments, and when we do have global uncertainty, it tends to strengthen the dollar, and obviously they need to factor that in. So I think the key today, and I think Ellen mentioned this in the earlier segment, what I'm going to be looking for, especially in the press conference, if we don't get in the statement, is the extent to which Yellen wants to hint that you know, the pause here is really about Brexit or if she wants to say that there really is a more fundamental <clears throat> concern about the U.S. economy, because essentially we've had one soft data point on the labor uh, market, which to many of us doesn't seem like enough of a reason to fundamentally change your, your course. So I'm going to be looking for that insight uh, today. Obviously, if uh, the Brits did vote to leave, we could see a problem with equity markets. But it's really the dollar that the Fed is going to watch, Rich, to see uh, the feedback into the United States economy. And yet, even with the leave group gaining ground, the dollar is falling. We're not seeing this flight to safety in the United States. Sure. Well, again, I think that, that right now there's a, there's a repricing of different probabilities. But I think if you do get concern about a contagion from Brexit to other countries in the European uh, Union, then most likely that would be a serious risk-off event. Also, it would, cl it would clearly impact credit spreads uh, as, as, as well. And we certainly do see credit spreads in the U.S. have widened uh, out. So there is an impact beyond just what you see on the dollar. Ellen Zentner, uh, of course, joining us from Morgan Stanley. When you look at what we're seeing in the U.K. Uh, with the pound all over the place and, of course, all the data out of China suggesting a slowdown there, does the Fed put more weight on what's going on in China or what's going on in the U.K.? Well, I think they can wrap it up in a very general fashion and say international and economic developments abroad that affect financial conditions here in the U.S. And that encompasses everything, similar to watching broad labor market indicators compasses, encompasses everything about the labor market. There are evils in the world, and there's, there are evils that lurk behind every corner. And it's going to be China today and China again three months from now and China again six months from now with reprieves in between. Um, but then you'll have big events 
events uh, that are more immediate, like Brexit. So just just taking into account mm -hmm. that you have to be an international Fed encompasses all of that. Uh, what I think is very unfortunate is that the the timing of, of Brexit uh, also uh, takes away some of the impact that we would get from Janet Yellen's semiannual testimony, because that comes two days before Brexit. Talk about a waste of a good meeting yeah. Yeah. Uh, to, or good testimony. We could have gotten some real nuggets from that, except that there's this looming gorilla two days later after she testifies. Ellen, I want to bring up the chart. I call it the lollipop chart, but it's really the Zentner was correct chart, which is time and time and time and time and time and time, time, time again. We can't get it going with a two-year yield. Once again, we roll over because of weak economic growth and the eight other reasons. Ellen Zentner, when do we get back to Clarida orthodoxy in our monetary <laughs> economics? We're waiting to get back to the economics that Clarida taught at Columbia. Ellen, when do we do it? Well, you can hear from the horse's mouth. Uh, you know, if, if I want to get some great advice, I can call Rich directly. But today, I waited to see him on Bloomberg instead. Yeah. Um, but, I, but I think one of the things that's become that's a theme in this show and that Rich has brought up as well is that negative feedback loop. You know, this happens in every policy tightening cycle where the Fed tries to go and there are negative feedbacks from <clears throat> policy tightening, and so they have to to, to right. pause uh, or or take care. Now, why have we been able to overcome? that in past policy tightening cycles because growth has been very strong and we don't have that same kind of growth okay. backdrop today. Richard Clarida, very quickly here, would you please explain when we get back to Keynesian and Phillips curve economics? Well, well, I, what I would say is I think the Fed has now embraced this notion we've talked about for several years of a new neutral. Indeed, Yellen herself says the reason for a gradual rate hike cycle is the neutral policy rate is very low and rising gradually over time. So that's the way that they think about it. When you talk about the labor market, average hourly earnings year to date are running at 3 uh, percent. So we are approaching full employment. Uh, we do see some pickup uh, in wages. The Atlanta Fed's measure is even higher. So I don't think we should be too dismissive of the basic uh, building blocks. I think the key insight that the Fed has now embraced is that there is a new neutral and they need a very gradual lift off to a low <laughs> destination, which is why I'm looking at those longer run dots today. And of course, Tom, you're going to put out that lollipop chart onto uh, Bloomberg Radio Plus, right? So everyone yeah, else can see I'll it. I'll do that right now. Okay, <laughs> thank you. I can do that. Don't I can forget do that about live on uh, We do have another chart, though, and uh, Mike, you're going to pull that up for us as well. Well, uh, hopefully I can uh, pull it up correctly. Yeah, I mean, this is what Rich was just talking about, uh, the idea that inflation expectations have gone down. Uh, the blue line, and we can put this out uh, on Bloomberg Radio as well, the blue line is consumer expectations. They're at a record low in the University of Michigan survey for inflation. The white line, the markets, the markets have been pessimistic about inflation for years. Why are consumers jumping in now, Rich, when uh, the economy is muddling along at a, you know, two to three percent rate and uh, you know, we're not seeing uh, major uh, inf disinflation anymore. Inflation starting to go up. Well, that's right. And I think the, I think the Michigan survey carries some weight because they've been doing it for a number of years and it does tend to evolve pretty slowly. So I'm sure it did get the chair's attention. She mentioned it in Philadelphia uh, the, the other day. And if I were Fed chair, I'd be paying attention to it uh, as well. I think to some extent these these survey measures get overly influenced perhaps by by energy or gasoline mm. uh, prices. But no, certainly I think there does need to be that focus. I'm just saying the underlying rate of inflation in the economy is approaching the Fed's uh, target. It is moving up as the labor market tightens, and I think they'll need to acknowledge that as well. So overall, as we wrap up everything here, Ellen, we look at uh, the political headwinds that global investors face. At a time when political uncertainty is rising, are we seeing right now the limits of monetary policy, central bank policy, not just in the U.S., but around the world? Well, I think with with policy near zero or even negative in some areas of the, of the world, uh, monetary policy uh, I don't want to say has run its course, but let's say we don't have as much in the toolbox as we used to. And this is something that Janet Yellen and company have embraced and why they still feel that when you're this close to zero, you have to be extraordinarily cautious in the additional steps that you take to tighten policy. So you maintain that tightening bias. As Rich said, look, mm -hmm. tighter labor markets, higher wage growth, that's going to keep them on a tightening bias. Um, but you also understand that you need to tread very, very lightly right. and cautiously. 
Leslie. Ellen Zentner, thank you so much. Good of you to join us before you speak to your Morgan Stanley clients this afternoon. We'll continue with Professor Clarida at PIMCO, their global market uh, strategist. We welcome all of you around uh, the world. Again, European interest rates really soggy on the close. of Swiss 20-year, a negative 0.115, and the German 10-year back to a negative yield this morning. We are worldwide on Bloomberg Radio. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good afternoon as well. This is a special report. The Fed decides on Bloomberg Television and Bloomberg Radio. I'm Scarlett Fu, along with Tom Keene and Michael McKee. We are counting you down to the Fed decision due out in just under 20 minutes. And of course, Mike, when you look at what's going on here and how the Fed needs to keep in mind all the different headwinds, uh, particularly in the markets, along with folding in the weak jobs report that really put the kibosh on any kind of June rate increase, uh, it's got to walk a pretty fine line when it comes out with its statement. Yeah, they are going to want to uh, explain why they're doing what they're doing. That's the key today. It's not just what they're doing, but why they're doing what they're doing. Let's take a look at the market's view. This is where the Fed can influence what is going on. You're looking there at OIS, overnight interest rate swaps, uh, going forward five years. Basically, uh, the, the, the swaps and the 10-year Treasury yield up top. And what that's showing you is where the market thinks the 10-year yield is going to be about halfway out in the five to 10-year period. It goes the down. Blue, blue line you take out the 10-year yield and you can see where the market actually thinks the effective interest rate in the market is and it's right now zero. it's below zero at, at almost a record low so the market at this point sees no in for no reason to tighten rates at all reason, going out there, five is, years stop is there a reason this is in denver broncos colors yes is there a reason for that i just yes want to because until, that. until september they're still the champions tough uh rich clarida the markets do not think there is any reason to tighten rates out five, ten years, and probably if I drew that line longer, if you could get swaps that far out in perpetuity. 
Well, I think I think what I would say is the markets are saying that that they don't expect over that horizon there to be much of a rate hike. Remember, when you look at those numbers, they're essentially weighing several scenarios. So they may think there's a 60 percent chance of a hike, but then there's a 40 percent chance of zero. And so what you do is you get an average somewhat below that. But no, you're absolutely right that what we've seen consistently is that there's been a gap between the market and the dots. And consistently, it's the dots that shift down, not the market that shifts uh, up. And that's a, and that's just a reality of the way the markets have viewed this uh, uh, Fed. Well, what is it that's going to? Uh, what will it take to change the market's view at this point? We do have inflation rising a little bit. You mentioned how wages are going up, e equities are not falling. They're having trouble making new right. records, but basically things are moving in the right direction. No, things are moving in the right direction, and I think that part, part of what's going on here is Yellen has a very, very difficult communications challenge. In my lifetime, and this, you know, goes back a number of decades, in my lifetime, this is the first rate hike cycle where the Fed has begun to hike rates when inflation is too low. The Fed's saying, we're hiking, but we want higher inflation. You know, that's a tough message to convey, and they're having some challenge conveying it. Also, in her recent talk in, in Philadelphia, she used the word uncertain or uncertainty 13 times times in a six-page speech. So everywhere Chair Yellen looks, she sees a lot of uh, uncertainty. And I guess the markets embrace that notion, and they don't see many rate hikes uh, in the pipeline. Uncertainty, caution, and of course, she also well, used the old economist standby on the one hand. On the other hand, I'm feeling yes. pretty good. I went right where Richard Clarida was, which is the Philadelphia speech of the chair. They were earlier. Tania, bring up the quote, please, from Chair Yellen. I love the humor here. Economists awful, often say, on the other hand, unlike Mr. Trump. So, in keeping with that tradition, I'll now turn to the less positive. And within her debate of your world, Richard Clarida, she talked about a mild undershooting of the unemployment rate, considered to be normal in the longer run uh, would lead you into the idea of what they would do with timing. Help us with this. How orthodox is this meeting today, or is this not in the textbooks you used at Columbia? Well, no, it, it, it is, interestingly enough. But again, the reason why it seems unusual is we've rarely had a Fed that's hiked rates when inflation is too low. So essentially what they're saying, and Stan Fisher has made this point very well, that yeah. policy accommodation is measured by the real interest rate. So even as the Fed is hiking, the funds rate is below inflation. Thus, policy is still very accommodative. So they view this not as tightening, but as a gradual removal of accommodation. Right. And their goal is actually to support a decline in the unemployment rate below the NIRU, which typically central banks don't like. In this case, they want to have a very, very tight labor market to push up inflation, to push up wages. So again, this is not, you know, your uncle or your grandmother's or uncle's <laughs> well, Fed rate mm -hmm. hike cycle. But a lot of the uncles and grandmothers and those supporting elected presidential candidates have a great loss of credibility with our institutions. Richard Clare, at 12 minutes here before this decision, yeah. how does this institution, your Fed, how do they get back credibility with Mr. Trump, with well. Dr. Paul and the others? How do they pull them back into our central bank fold? Well, I, I, won't, I won't get into particular U.S. candidates, but broadly, I think all the world's central banks, the ECB, the Bank of Japan, uh, certainly, uh, because of what they felt it was necessary to do uh, in uh, the crisis, they wandered into the, into the <clears throat> sandbox of fiscal policy. And, you know, traditionally, fiscal policy is done by the Congress and the President and the Treasury. It's not done by uh, the Fed. And so I think this is, this is inevitable. I don't think it's going to diminish. Right. I think there will be political pressure on central banks, including the Fed, for the foreseeable future. Well, to gain credibility, we're going to continue with Richard Claret of PIMCO. And again, Mike, we're thrilled to have the vice chairman, Alan Blinder, will join us here in a bit. Yeah, and still ahead, before Janet Yellen's news conference, the statement, three things that you need to look out for in today's remarks from the Fed itself. That's next on The Fed Decides, Bloomberg Television and Radio.
Well, we are moments away from the Fed decision. It may not be live, but it's going to happen anyway. And they are going to put a statement out at the top of the hour, giving their reasons for what they do, even if they don't do anything. Here are three things you need to watch for in the statement. And we're going to bring in Rich Clarita from PIMCO as well and play a little game. Keep or change. Here are the main oh, you are things that they're going to have to look at. The labor market, inflation expectations, and global outlook. Let's take a look at uh, labor market expectations in the last statement the Fed said labor market conditions have improved further even as growth in economic activity appears to have slowed rich Clarida keep it or change it change it <laughs> How, what do they say then I think and they may reverse it they may say the economy has picked up from Q1 but the labor market appears to have softened do you think the markets panic at that if they do that no, I think I think that's acknowledged. I think Yellen gave a pretty strong hint of that in her Philadelphia uh, speech. Uh, she could have chosen at that speech to basically say it's one data point. So I think they I think they will uh, downgrade the assessment of the labor market. All right, Tom Keene was still riding a bicycle when the Fed put this into the statement: market-based measures of inflation compensation remain low. Survey-based measures of long-term inflation expectations are little changed on balance in recent months. Now that part of the statement hasn't changed forever. Is the Michigan number enough to change it, or do they keep it, Rich? I, 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 I. Yellen indicated she, that she's following that closely. I think it's close, but I actually think they, I think the trick with changing it is you, you, you maybe spook folks. So I think it's a close call. I guess my gut tells me they will change it, though. And of course, the last thing is the big change they made from January until March, where they took out the line, the extensive line about the global developments they were watching and just said the committee continues to closely monitor inflation indicators and global economic and financial developments. Well, you got China. You certainly have Brexit. Rich, do they go beyond that or do they just leave it at that at this point? I, I think they leave that unchanged. Yeah. Do you realize that language is like at our dining room table? That's how you, you know, talk the, to the committee has decided what we will do this week. <laughs> that is frightening. It, the language doesn't say anything. It's it's bland. Well, does Rich Clarita, does the Fed acknowledge that household spending has been doing okay? The retail sales report, for instance, came in better yeah. than expected. Personal spending has been holding up. Well, exactly. That's why I mentioned in response to Mike's first point that, in fact, you know, Q1 was very, very soft, and, and Q2 is shaping up to be growth of around two and a half percent. Possibly, the consumer numbers have been uh, have been good. So, uh, yeah, I think they want to acknowledge that we have had a pickup, and, and, and of course, we need a pickup for the Fed's forecast right. for the year to play out. So, yeah. I want to go to the economist Michael McKee. Mike, when was your first <laughs> Fed meeting? Was Burns? Chairman, <laughs> I, I mean, come on, how did we get to these statements? Tania, put up one of those quotes again. Mike McKee, the how did we get from that. what you remember, yes or no, keep or change, to the silliness of this language? Well, the very first statement, which came out in 1994, Alan Greenspan said, we changed rates and we just wanted to let you know because we might do it again. And now you have <laughs> these lengthy statements. Rich Carter, is this worse for the markets, this uh, yeah. added clarity, or is it uh, better for the markets to have more information? No, I think I think it is. I think the challenge for the Fed is not that there's too much information. The challenge for the Fed is they really haven't figured out what their reaction function is. And so you have 17 different people communicating a muddled message. But so I don't think communication is the problem. The, the problem is that the committee itself sees the world differently and would react to it differently. I'm convinced that, you know, with a different mix on the committee, uh, we would have a different uh, dynamic. So I think that's the challenge. The committee members see the world differently. Does that get conveyed, though, the way they vote because as far as I can remember most of the votes have been unanimous. Well, but yes, and of course that that's a, a usual, Charlotte, it's a good question. It doesn't show up in the voting, but it does show up in all the incessant Fed speak that we get between the meetings. Um, and so, you know, the ratio of noise to signal is sometimes tough to uh, 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 disentangle. Uh, but you are right. There is a tradition, especially among the presidentially appointed uh, board uh, members, to support the chair. Right. And we're less than five minutes away from that Fed decision and Fed statement. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason I ask, Rich Clarida, is because Charles Plosser, former former Philadelphia Fed president has said that there's a veneer of consensus, right? Uh, he says the downside to a consensus vote is that it necessitates vague language. If you can't vote what you really want to vote, then you have to couch everything in those terms that, that Mike just read us, where Tom is confused and, and <laughs> likens it to his dinnertime conversation. Yeah. 
Well, and I, th I think the real innovation here, and I give Ben Bernanke credit uh, for this, and Yellen's continued it, the real innovation here is to have the regularly scheduled press conference yeah. where the chair can use the bully pulpit to give you her read <clears throat> of the situation. Bernanke used that well, and I think Yellen has used it uh, effectively uh, as well. Professor, we need a class uh, room primer right now on overshoot. It's been it showed up a lot like Slack. Maybe overshoot's the new Slack. Uh, Blinder of Princeton, Claret of Columbia and PIMCO. I've put this chart out, a chart out on Bloomberg Radio Plus, but it's two measures of CPI going up and everybody in hopes and prayers that they want to overshoot, which is a phrase from Rudy Dornbush uh, of MIT, who tragically died a number of years ago. Professor Clarida, can a central bank manage an overshoot or are they dreaming? Well, that's a good question, because my view, and I've written about this and said so on your short show, is I actually think they do want to overshoot, or put it this way, they won't be unhappy if there's a modest uh, overshoot of the inflation target. They're in a box, because on the one hand, they say 2%'s not a ceiling, it's supposed to be an average, but on the other hand, they've been below average for five years, and so at some point, they may <clears throat> need to engineer a modest uh, overshoot. That said, they don't want to overdo it, uh, and that's why they're sort of being too, too coy for my taste in terms of saying that they're not aiming to overshoot, but they want inflation to be on average 2%. Let's run through a data check here, and Michael McKee, I want you to jump in with some final uh, thoughts with Scarlett. The data check simple, equities, bonds, currencies, commodities. I'm going to add in some features here, a bounce in the equity market. Two-year yields been gyrating, but as, as we showed in that chart uh, a good hour ago, the idea of the two-year yield lower, 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 and disappointing uh, people with a 10-year 1.61 and oil soggy. Mike, jump in here with an intraday uh, chart to help out. Well, we're looking at the five-year yield, and this is going to be one of the ones that's most traded, most affected by Agreed. what uh, the Fed does today. And it's been kind of volatile. We did see yields rise. Now, as we go into the morning, uh, they fall, and they're coming back again, which suggests that uh, they're well, expecting maybe a hawkish statement, if not a uh, move right. today. How much of a reaction did we really see to the PPI numbers that came out this yeah. morning, which showed a little bit of a better gain than had been anticipated by economists? Mike? Not a whole lot, yeah. uh, but it does show, again, it, it, it feeds into this idea that things are getting a little bit better out there. Uh, we did have the industrial production numbers uh, right. put a little wet blanket on it, but in general, uh, you know, the numbers aren't that bad. Let's fold in the second data screen here. I'm going to make it way more international than I ever, ever, ever have done at a Fed meeting. Yen, that 105 is still stunning. We'll let Professor Clarida comment on the death of Abinomics. 105.92. Two ten spread is flattened out. This is a big deal. Michael Darda in a research note an hour ago, again, noticing business uh, delinquencies up. There's a curve flattening. You wonder where that's uh, going. There's a two-year yield again. And Scarlett, very quickly here, German two-year negative 0 0.60, German 10-year back to a negative statistic. All you got to know is this is maybe the most international meeting I've seen that a chair has to face. Absolutely. And it's not just Germany, right? You also see yields in Japan and the UK fall to record lows as well. I'm really focused on dollar yen here because it, the move has just been enormous and it's something that the Bank of Japan can't like at all. Uh, Tom, we've talked about the two standard deviation move in dollar yen over the last couple of weeks. And at what point the Bank of Japan perhaps needs to step in as well. You know that they're keeping a very close eye on what happens at this Fed meeting because, of, of course, Kuroda has to follow up with his own meeting later on. Yeah, but his problem is the same as Janet Yellen's, is the same as Mark Carney's. They don't know what is going to happen in the Brexit vote. So the feeling is maybe they have to just wait, too, and move in July. And don't forget, the Swiss National Bank as well is coming out with its statement as well. They would all love to know how the Brits are going to vote. All right, let's take a look at uh, how the pound is trading actually at the moment because the British pound has been a little bit all over the place here in the lead up to the Brexit vote, currently at 141.60. We want to check in now as well with Eric Shasker, who is live from the Federal Reserve. No change, no change in interest rates. I repeat, no change in interest rates. The Fed, in a unanimous decision, is holding at a quarter percentage point. What's more important, of course, is the outlook, the outlook for rate increases, the dots, if you Will, and there another big shift by the Fed to lower for longer. I repeat, lower for longer, everybody. Well, a majority of the Fed voting members, these are the members of the Federal Open Market Committee, still anticipate two interest rate increases by the end of the year. 
Six. Six now favor only a single 25 basis point hike. You'll recall in March, the last time we saw the dots, only one member of the FOMC was that dovish. Plus, the committee now expects to raise rates at a slower pace in 2017 and 2018. Not only is this Fed more dovish, it has grown more dovish since the last meeting in April. Remember, from the minutes, most voting members were ready to raise rates at this meeting in June if data on growth, jobs, and inflation continued to strengthen. Well, of course, we had that disastrous May jobs report, and today here's what the Fed said, and I quote, the pace of improvement in the labor market has slowed, and also, quote, market-based measures of inflation compensation declined. In other words, not enough to justify a rate hike. Notably, there was no mention in the policy statement of the Brexit risk. The Fed is clearly on hold for now and giving absolutely no sign how soon it may move off a quarter point. We may find out more. We certainly hope to in the press conference with Janet Yellen that begins at 2.30. Eric, thank Scarlet you so Mike. much. And uh, really, you're dead on about the dovish statement that we've seen. And we've seen a major market move. Give me the data screens right now, Tania. If you would, I want to show dollar yet here in a moment up on the screen, Michael. Uh, the data screens with the equity market up 84 and the VIX plunges. That is the complacency of an equity market that will be supported by the Fed uh, with the VIX 19.20. Uh, the two-year yield does a Michael McKee reversal going from 0.72 down to 0.60. The 10-year goes right back to recent low yields and oil not churning. Bring on the second data screen uh, as well. Looking here at that yen, I'll show it in a moment. Strong, strong yen, dollar churning, two tens, a little bit steeper. Michael, very quickly, because I know you've got important comments. Here is the dollar and the yen, the global litmus paper of the system. And all you need to know, Scarlett, down we go and we leg down. This is crushing for Mr. Abe. There's no other way to put it. Well, as a Mohammed al Arian of uh, Allianz had told me, this is a complete yeah. nightmare Do, for the Bank of Japan. Are you ready for dots? We're ready for dots. Yes. Our dots go chart has already updated. So those of you with well, Luke, a take a look at that. And you can see what Eric was just talking about. A number of people have moved their forecast down. And now the consensus is basically, if you're looking at the median, one more move before the end of the year would take us to a range of 50 to 75 basis points. That's the new median. So so we're not expecting two more moves this year, although there is a substantial number of people who still think we should have just one. That's all the way over at the left-hand side. By the end of 2017, it looks like they're pricing in four moves next year because you get to just a little over 1.6%. And then you go all the way out to the final, the, the, the longer term, and you're looking at uh, what right now, 2.95. They've come down below 3%. So they're coming down a long way towards the market. You can see the purple line. The, uh, those of you who are watching on television, we can't show it to you on radio, unfortunately, but uh, you can see the, the market expectation has moved up a little bit as well as they digest what the Fed has seen. So this is kind of what the Fed wants. They want to move closer together. Mm -hmm. The market wants them to move down, maybe not as much as they have, but they're moving in the direction that the market's been calling for. The Fed wanted those lines to move closer together, but it was the Fed that came down, not the market that went up. The uh, market's come up a little bit out in the out years, 2018, but <clears throat> not uh, as much as the Fed has come down. Well, another way of looking at what the Fed is, uh, what the market is looking at is to check out the WIRP function on the Bloomberg work function, which measures world interest rate probability, and here we're using the OIS. Right now, market participants expect an 8.6% chance of a rate increase on the July 27th uh, meeting. Uh, you compare that with, let's say, the previous day, where it was at 15.8%. Uh, and in terms of going out further, let's say uh, the Fed, the market doesn't really see the odds of a rate hike increase to more than 40% until next year. February 1st uh, is the first time we see odds higher than 40% of a net right. rate increase. Professor Clarida, when I read your 1996, I believe it is, paper, when I read Blanchard, when I read Fisher, all of this conversation didn't exist. Do our elite economists actually know where they're trying to take the ship? 
Oh, sure. I think I, I think that, as I mentioned earlier, I think the big the big change, obviously, compared to the pre-crisis understanding, is central banks need to take a, a stand and focus and try to get a sense of, of where neutral or natural uh, is. And I think that's the way to interpret uh, this Fed. It's also a risk management approach when you're close uh, to, uh, to to zero. So I wouldn't completely throw out the textbook, but I think it's a much harder problem they're trying to solve than the one right. central banks thought they were solving before the crisis. Mike, a question for Professor Claire. Mike, look at this. This is not Kochel or Kodak, right? This dot down here? No, that's uh, it's not there anymore. That's the that's the trader sitting over on Forty uh, Fifth Street. Is, is this this <laughs> is a bad joke from Claire? This is like Scott Mather or somebody. Uh, Mike, come on. This is not what they planned when they did the dots to have these massive outliers, right? That's not what they planned. Oh. Let's uh, bring in Eric Schatzker, because, Eric, you've been combing through the release as well. You've noted a couple of changes in uh, Chair Yellen's uh, stance, her language, from December until now. Tell us what you well, found. More than, I'm actually, Scarlett, looking more at the dots, because remember back in December when the Fed got, uh, December, excuse me, when the Fed got off zero and raised rates by a quarter point? It anticipated raising rates four more times over the course of 2016. Just to give you a sense of how much more dovish this Fed has grown in that six-month period, back in December, 13 of the 17 voting members on the FOMC saw benchmark rates at 1% or above by the end of 2016. 13 of 17, now only 2 of 17 do. In December, 12 of those 17 members saw rates at 2% or above by the end of 2017 and now only three do. What a dramatic change from December to today. It's truly incredible. I want to point out one other thing. The Fed is sticking to this word gradual. Gradual rate increases over time, ultimately getting the FOMC and the economy back to what they call normalization. And we're going to hear, I hope, Janet Yellen explain why in the face of these deteriorating inflation expectations, the Fed is sticking to this idea that gradual is even warranted at this point. Some people are surely going to question whether that word needs to be in this statement and whether the Fed can truly contemplate normalization at this time. Well, Eric, they are certainly gradual in their forecast for next year. You're only getting to about one and a half percent. The statement, but, though, pretty bland about what's going on, doesn't really explain why they have come down so much. True, true. The statement is very short on detail. Mike, the reason I make the point gradual, because gradual was the word they were using back in December. And if you used the dot plot to define gradual in December, it was more or less a rate hike one of every two meetings. Now we've had the Fed on hold for four successive meetings, and Yellen and company are giving us absolutely no clue. We may get another clue when we get into that room, but giving us no clue when the next rate hike may come. And you really... Look, the Fed is concerned about its credibility. That word crept into the minutes. The Fed has to be concerned about credibility in the use of the word gradual and its path towards normalization, given where we are today relative to where we were in December when it was using the very same language. Right. I mean, the contrast between now and December is pretty dramatic. Richard Clarida, managing director at PIMCO, is still with us. Uh, Rich, the longer run Fed funds rate was cut to 3% from 3.3%. Is this an admission, Richard Clarida, that the, this business cycle we're in right now is different than what we've seen in the past and that interest rates overall will not return to what we think of as normal? Oh, that's absolutely the case, and this is an enormous uh, acknowledgement by this Fed. In 2012, when they started the dots, that longer-run dot was at 4.25. It's now at 3, so it's fallen substantially, and I, if that's the median, I don't have the dots in front of me. I'm in a studio here. I assume that there are some p potentially below that as well. And so, you know, this is what we've called a new neutral for monetary policy. This will not be like traditional rate hike cycles. It will not only be gradual, as Eric says, but it's to a much lower uh, destination. And so this is an a complete acknowledgement by the Fed that this is the world that they're navigating right now. Absolutely. Professor Clarida, where is the terminal rate? John Herman published a note three days ago with a sub 2% terminal rate, which I find socially and politically unacceptable for the nation. In your estimation, where is the terminal rate? that all of our terminal users, all of the people watching this that wouldn't know dots go if it hit them over the head, where are we going in three or five or even 10 years? 
Okay, well, uh, what, I, what we've said at PIMCO is that there is a new neutral, which we've defined as a Fed funds rate in the range of 2 to 3 percent. And I think now, given where the Fed is right now, it's probably at the lower end of that range. It's, it's probably 2. But with 2 percent inflation, that means a real return on cash of, of zero compared to 200 basis points before the uh, uh, crisis. And I think the other thing in 5 or 10 years is we'll probably have a recession between now and then. I mean, I hope we don't. But, but if we do, then obviously the Fed is not going to be hiking, it's going to be cutting. So that's the other factor to take into account as well. You know, what we haven't talked about is the Fed's new economic forecast, and they have made some significant changes here. They're bringing down their GDP forecast, not just for this year, but going out to uh, 2018. They now see the economy growing 1.9 to 2% this year. They had in March seen 2.1 to 2.3, and in 2018, 1.8 to 2.1. Uh, so they do see slower growth, but at the same time, they see rich, faster inflation. They're calling for a PCE price index of 1.3 to 1.7 percent this year. In March, they only saw 1 percent to 1.6 percent. Yeah, well, I think that this recognizes that the, that the potential growth rate in the economy has really slowed. It's slowed uh, globally. And, and so I think in their view, you know, you've got slow rate of potential growth. The output gaps uh, are closing. And their models are telling them that you should get a pickup uh, in inflation. As I said, this is a Fed that wants higher inflation. I know that sounds like a, uh, like a contradiction. This is a Fed that's hiking rates and wants higher inflation. So that's, that's the way their models uh, instruct them. Yeah. Richard Claret are with us with PIMCO, and he will continue uh, with us. Let me do a data check here. Some major moves in the fixed income uh, market right now. Equities, I'm going to call it a churn up 50 points, uh, but the two-year yield goes round trip over the last 48 hours. We went from 0.6768 up to 7.2 and go right back down near the low end of what I guess is a recent uh, range. A 10-year yield at a 159 near that 158 level. Good morning and good evening, I should say, to Steve Major in London with HSB see on his brilliant call of 1.50 uh, percent and oil in as well. Scarlett, as you have correctly stated, yen is everything. The yen at a 105.77. You really wonder how Japan will wake up on their Thursday morning. 105.62 was the low of the session and of course this is the weakest level or I should say the weakest level for the dollar uh, against the yen since September of 2014. I want to bring in uh, Mike Swell. He is co-head of Global Fixed Income Portfolio Management at Goldman Sachs asset management to give us the buy side perspective of what this Fed statement means. So are you changing how you are allocating your funds? Are you changing how you are uh, putting your money right now, given what we've just learned? Well, this one statement is not going to cause us to change how we position portfolios. If you really think about where the news is, the news wasn't in the Fed statement today. The news was in the job report. The news was in the lower inflation expectations in the marketplace. The news was in slower corporate earnings. So there are some fundamentals that are causing some changes in the economy that are causing us to change the way we're positioned in portfolios. But, but the news was also in the way the Fed interpreted and, and, and framed the data that we've been getting and we've all been reacting to. Well, as all of you have said and some of your speakers have said, the Fed is just catching up with the market. And so really what the Fed is doing right now is reporting the news and following the market in our view. Central tendency for one more rate increase this year, uh, lowering growth forecasts. At this point, uh, are you going to be able to go on vacation in July? Just forget that meeting. There's a lot going on across markets. You think about Brexit, you think about China risk, you think about a slower economy in the U.S. Those are things that keep us at night more than a single Fed meeting. Uh, the risk of, of, of rate, rising rates, I would say that the opposite obviously now is the risk. And the risk is that we're in a slower economy and recession risk is higher now. And so that's something that gives us a little bit more concern. What I want to know with your trading background, with your work at FBR and at Goldman Sachs, is what's going to be the stability when you finally get a jump condition. You've got guys working for you. They're 28 years old. They just took level two, level three. Do they have all the answers? I think they do. They haven't been tested like you've been tested. When you get that jump condition, how are the markets going to react? 
Well, if you look around our floor, we have more and more people actually with gray hair. You have so more and more Bloombergs. People. That's well, all I care the Fed about. is taking so long we, to we raise a, rates. We have a ton of Bloombergs. Good. Uh, okay, you can stay with gen us. Generation Xers, Yers, and Zers are getting Bloombergs as well. So um, we, we're actually we're, we're coaching them, but I think that they they are students of history, and so we are very much focused, and we are actually much more concerned about um, where things go in terms of the risk of the slowdown of the global economy. Hey. And so we're, we're trying to coach younger people in terms of making decisions. What I want to know from you is what is a litmus paper you need for Mike, the July meeting or the September meeting? It's not LIBOR OIS. It's not commercial paper. What's the thermometer for you in the trenches at Goldman Sachs Asset Management? So it's a, it's a couple things. I would say that Number one, and the thing that the Fed is watching most closely is financial conditions. So we watch the financial conditions index very closely. The Bloomberg Financial Stability Index? Bloomberg is one of them. Yes. Goldman okay. Sachs happens to have one as well. Put a little Damn. plug in for the firm. Uh, and and uh, if you look at where financial conditions are right now, they're at about the same place where they were back in December when the Fed uh, tightened for the first time. So that's number one. Number two is we're looking for an increase in inflation expectations. So we're watching the wage data very closely. Wages are sneaking up a little bit, but what you've seen in a number of surveys recently is a slowdown in inflation expectations. That gives us concern because it gives the Fed concern. You talk about your traders being students of history. History has always been the Fed starts and then they go too much too fast. With this dots chart and the way they've brought it down, are you finally willing to accept the word gradual? The world has changed. Gradual is a uh, part of our future, so absolutely. So we have to recognize that your historical models, historical volatility models, they have to be thrown out the door. We're in a different world. This financial crisis was severe, and you have to think about how the world's going to operate on a go-forward basis. The other thing that was a presumption of all students of the U.S. economy and of central bank policy was that the U.S. was a closed economy. What happened outside of the U.S. in general doesn't matter. That's not true anymore. Capital flows are significant. They're having a big impact on our market. Joining us, Mike Swell, with his terrific uh, uh, heritage with Goldman Sachs Asset Management on the actual trading and doing of things in the market. Richard Clarity with PIMCO. Mike, let's get to Clarity in a minute. But I got one question for you. I remember the day we blew up in August of 07, and David Vinier was talking about four standard deviation moves in T-bill. I was talking about LIBOR, LIBOR, OIS, or that. How close in your estimate? That's the wrong question. How deep is the market now to withstand a four standard deviation shock? Um, liquidity is incredibly challenged across markets. Thank you. And, and, and we've seen that. There's no question that that is a challenge. Um, however, I would say, though, that, that you're going to have more and more short-term blips in markets because of the changes in regulation, changes in liquidity. But in the end, real money matters. Economics matter more than liquidity. So in the event that we have a world where there's moderate level of growth, we have moderate level of inflation, something like Brexit, something like a uh, credit concern in China is not going to blow up the financial system. It could cause a short-term increase in volatility, but long run, it's going to be the fundamentals that matter. And of course, it's the volatility, liquidity, and economics that have perhaps caused a lot of funds to pull back and raise their cash levels. Rich Clarida, there is talk uh, that cash levels at funds are higher than 5.7%, which would be close to millennial highs. How do you read that? Is that an ex indication that investors are pricing in the prospect of recession? I don't think necessarily recession, but I think it is prudent, and we think it is prudent in, in markets where you have had some spread uh, compression. And, you know, remember, two, two or three weeks ago, the VIX was at 13, and it hit 21 the other day. So you have to have your cash levels reflecting not only liquidity, but you think pricing and valuation. So I think it makes absolutely good sense uh, to be running uh, higher than average uh, cash uh, levels in these markets. Absolutely. And Mike Swell? I would agree 100%. If you look at what's happened in markets, you look at the credit markets, credit markets have performed incredibly well because rates are negative everywhere else and rates in the U.S. are somewhat positive. And so as a result, our view is that it's come too far. There's risk to the economy. We think that there's risk that credit spreads widen. And if you look at it from a seasonal perspective, the summer is usually not the best time to invest in risk assets. Well, I mean, are we at a point now, and the Fed seems to be on hold for quite some time. I'll ask you and I'll ask Rich. Are you getting to the point where cash is an acceptable substitute? In other words, is, is the Fed distorting the market so much that people don't need to buy assets? Um, I, I think that the debate around generating positive returns for investors is going to become a bigger and bigger issue. It's been a big issue in Europe, a big issue in Japan. And now with rates so low in the U.S., it's become a big risk, big issue here. So I actually think that, that in the event that the Fed is more dovish and we're going to be in this 
slower growth environment, but low risk of recession, you're going to see more and more money potentially come into the U.S. market to generate positive yields. And the key is you don't want to stretch and take too much direct economic risk, but still try, try to find ways in a high quality way to generate returns. Well, Rich Clarida, are we getting to a point now where markets are so distorted that you don't want to buy a negative rate instrument because you got to pay to get it? Uh, is the safety not worth it? Well, exactly. So I think I think that negative rates certainly, and, and thankfully we've avoided that in the U.S. Negative rates are a distortion uh, to the system, and I think that that we think we're in a world. We've referred to it as a world of insecure stability. We think the world appears to be stable, but that's deceptive. And in that world, we think it makes sense to focus as much on preserving capital as it does to return uh, on capital. Mm -hmm. You want to make sure you get the return of your capital uh, in this in this right. world, and I think that should guide investing. Mike, I've got a delicate question as we go to Asia and particularly as we go to Europe tomorrow. I don't want to get you in the Michael Sherwood timeout chair, but I'm going to try. <laughs> if I look at European banks, they are performing miserably. Do you see liquidity in the European market off of this Fed meeting today and onto the next economic mumbo jumbo that will allow these banks to finally heal themselves as Goldman Sachs and American banks healed themselves years ago? Is there trading stability within the Europe that you look at out of New York and out of London? There is very limited credit availability or credit creation going on in Europe because of the capital challenges of the banks. So unless the banks and the countries that uh, support a lot of these banks bite the bullet and decide to recapitalize their banks, right. you're going to be in a situation yes. where you're going to continue to see very, very low levels of growth and potentially deflation in, uh, in Europe. I go back to your skill set in the trenches here using Bloomberg's at Goldman Sachs in the basic idea that you have to compete with Mario Draghi for paper. Am I right that, that that's what's going on right now? Well, you're essentially pricing the banks out of the high quality markets and the banks Thank generate you. earnings. Yeah. They're going to rely upon taking additional risk and more right. risk. The problem with that, it's a, it's, a, it's a vicious cycle that's going on in Europe, is right. that with this continued slow growth, there is no demand to expand. There's too much concern around regulation, too much concern around political risk in Europe. So you're finding the companies are hoarding cash and they're not expanding. Therefore, they don't want Scott, any more is, loans from This the is great to see Mike Swell in the trenches okay. of this versus Professor Clarida, who's in first class flying at 60,000 feet. <laughs> 60,000 no, feet no. is not a bad place to be. Uh, let's get back into the trenches for a moment here and take a look at dollar yen. We were keeping a very close eye on it. And the look dollar fell to wow. as low as 105.43 against the Japanese yen. So it's been down, down, down for the dollar versus the yen. Keep in mind that before the May jobs report, dollar yen was at 108.87. Well, before the April FOMC, it was at 111.31. Okay. We're all friends here. Professor Clarida, I'm going to call an audible. The basic idea here of yen towards 100, would you suggest we see some form of intervention by the Japanese, whether it's a traditional yeah. intervention in the currency market? Yeah, no, that, that, that's tricky because, you know, they have said and probably behind the scenes they've made assurances that they, they've learned uh, from the past and they're not going to be intervening. They've been given a green light to do QE, and obviously when they were doing that in surprising markets, it weakened the yen. But my gut tells me if we actually are at 100 and through it, that, that I think that would be a magic number that would probably trigger some, some intervention out of the MOF. Remember, it's the MOF that does it, not the BOJ, so it would be the Ministry of Finance. But, yeah, I think a move to yeah, 100 could me. well trigger that. Yeah, something to keep in mind, though, is that the U.S. Treasury has been very firm in saying, don't do that. Mm -hmm. How far will they let them go, uh, Rich? In the past, we have cooperated. G7 statement says we got to cooperate. Does the rest of the G7 let uh, Japan just go down the tubes? Well, I think if you look at the, at the diplomatic language around those communiques, there's always boilerplate about volatility and unstable markets, and nobody knows that. But if you move, you know, the yen was at 122 not too long ago, and if it goes south of 100, that, that's a pretty brutal move. And, and, so, uh, and so, again, it wouldn't shock me if we—and I'm not saying we will see that level, but if we do, it wouldn't shock me if we actually saw well, some, some intervention. Very quickly here, this is amazing. We got a new leg down. Scarlett identified the yen to a 105.61. Uh, Mike Swell, I mean, this is remarkable. This is two-year yield semi-log, and we've taken a whole new leg down well outside two standard deviations of, of the trend. Is Janet Yellen losing control of her management of people like you? 
No, I, I don't think so. I think that the if I, if I had to look at the single piece of news that came out of this Please. report, and again, I didn't have the benefit of reading the report, but no, either what do you're we, talking but about. That's a detail. The, the, the key point here is that six members of the Fed decided to move their expectations of two increases in 2016 to one. Therefore, we think that one of those people is Chair Yellen. So we actually think now that the probability of two hikes, although it's still the mean uh, for 2016, has gone down. What is it gonna, that going to impact? It's going to impact the two-year. Look at the 10-year. The 10-year is going to be much more relevant to the future path for rates. And there you're seeing a small move in terms of rates. Richard, Clarida, before we let you go, what is the number one thing you will want to hear from Janet Yellen today during her news conference? You know, yeah, I, 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 you know, this is a very much glass is half empty <clears throat> statement. So I'm going to be looking for Yellen to, to, to indicate some uh, positive uh, uh, outlook. This is a very dovish statement. We'll, we'll see if she tries to create a two-way read of their intentions or if she wants to reinforce, you know, this very dovish uh, statement. Mike Swell, how about you? I think you're, you're going to see a little bit of clarifying balance out of Chair Yellen today. To, to yeah. offset what she to had to offset in a little bit of dovish. Yeah, the market is really taking this as a dovish move here. I think it's clearly dovish for 2016. I think the forward path, again, it's going to be relying upon the data. So we're spending a little too much time right. worrying about what the Fed is articulating versus let's look at the economy. Yeah, yeah. We, we know the dot plots don't remain active for that long. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we want to thank Richard Clarida, of course, of PIMCO. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, let's get a data check. Uh, we've been obsessed with dollar yen, Tom, but we need to be, uh, re we need to well, be reminded to check the two-year and the 10-year yield as well because they've moved dramatically in know, the aftermath of this statement. Yeah, uh, let me say this. A shout-out to Michael McKee who nailed the dots volatility here and what it would mean for the markets. And I suggested the press conference would actually be really most interesting. Now I think we can say that, Michael. Well, we've seen the two-year note yield really reprice what the Fed is going to do. This isn't just dots. This isn't uh, Fed funds. You can see the two-year taking out Move, you know, two moves this year. We're down to uh, 66 basis points, basically round up to 67. Uh, we're at the uh, Fed funds uh, right now are trading around 37 basis points in the midpoint of the 25 to 30 range. So you're not even at a midpoint of a move up to 75. We welcome all of you on Bloomberg Television Worldwide, Bloomberg Radio as well, worldwide on Sirius XM and of course across our many channels uh, in this nation. It was an interesting, uh, interesting and surprising uh, 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 announcement. Uh, Mike Swell of Goldman Sachs Asset Management with us. And you suggest that one of these lower dovish dots is the uber dove now janet yellen we think there's a shift uh in chair yellen's uh, uh forecast for 2016 and that's the that's really the news here and that's why the two years is Jan hot i don't want you to speak for dr hotsius but is he going to have to mark down his view of gdp off of what we heard today You'd have to ask him that question. Okay, but nicely skirted. <laughs> one, point we, one point we should make, since you're talking about Chair Yellen there, is that we did not have a dissent this time. Esther George from the Kansas City Fed went along with everybody. We don't know. She's probably one of the higher dots on the list. She's been arguing that the Fed should raise rates, but this time she right. did not. Does that matter to you, Mike Swell, whether there's dissent among Fed officials? Not at all. Not at all. Again, mm -hmm. I'm back to the data. The Fed is not the news here. The Fed is not really going to drive. What the is the news then? The news is the is the job number. Is that is that real or not? Uh, the news is inflation expectations. Uh, do we look at what's happened or is, are we concerned about the, the view news, of the economy? And this goes back to your decades of working in fixed income. Is the news that we're in a great distortion of negative and near negative interest rates where nobody knows what to do at the true and new zero bound? It's a, uh, it's a risk that the issues that are occurring in Europe and occurring in Japan and occurring throughout the globe are having a significant disproportionate impact on you the U.S. economy in a way that our economic right. models never told us. Dr. Fu, can I ask a dumb question of the day? Dr. Fu got promoted. Can I ask a dumb question? Mike Swell, do you make money when you trade negative interest rate paper? You can. You can. Uh, there's no question you can. Number one, you can make it by being short. So you can make money in the event that you think rates are going to rise. You can actually... See how he lights up exposure. like that? He lights up like Gary Cohen. That's amazing how he lights so up. So does that mean you're doing something with German Bunds? We like to make money on behalf of our clients. Actually, we are, and we have been making money, actually owning German Bunds. We actually own them. I know they're at the negative rates and long term. Right. It's going to be a terrible investment. So, but we believe in the near term, you're going to see continued okay. pressure on inflation and the ECB is going to continue to act. Oh, well, here's my question then. The Brits, all right, they don't, they vote to stay in. Can you trade out of Bunds fast enough not to get killed or any of these other trades that are based on this? 
Um, of course we can. The question is price and and because everybody's going to say that. Everybody's going to go to the door at the same time. How can well, you hedge with vol where it is on sterling? I would say that the sterling markets are incredibly challenged based on the Thank you. very, very rapid move over the course of the last few days of the changing expectations around Brexit. So very, very difficult. Right now, you're in a situation where most of the direct Brexit risk is mm -hmm. pretty efficiently priced. Uh, and if you look at the U.S. Treasury market, one of the reasons we're at such low yield levels, despite the fact of the news today, right. is that you've seen an, an, a lot of capital coming out because of the concern around Brexit buying treasuries. But in the end, I think you um, very hard to hedge. But I think in terms of the ability to move, you f uh, people, I think, to some degree, overstate right. the liquidity challenges in markets. And look, we see Janet Yellen coming up to the podium. She's getting ready to speak. This is her news conference following the Fed's rate decision. Let's go live now to Washington, D.C., where Chair Janet Yellen is getting ready to Good give afternoon. her prepared remarks. Today, the Federal Open Market Committee maintained the target range for the federal funds rate at one quarter to one half percent. This accommodative policy should support further progress toward our statutory objectives of maximum employment and price stability. Based on the economic outlook, the committee continues to anticipate that gradual increases in the federal funds rate over time are likely to be consistent with achieving and maintaining our objectives. However, recent economic indicators have been mixed suggesting that our cautious approach to adjusting monetary policy remains appropriate. As always, our policy is not on a preset course, and if the economic outlook shifts, the appropriate path of policy will shift correspondingly. I will come back to our policy decision, but first I will review recent economic developments in the outlook. Economic growth was relatively weak late last year and early this year. Some of the factors weighing on growth were expected. For example, exports have been soft, reflecting subdued foreign demand and the earlier appreciation of the dollar. Also, activity in the energy sector has obviously been hard hit by the steep drop in oil prices since mid-2014. But the slowdown in other parts of the economy was not expected. In particular, business investment outside of energy was particularly weak during the winter and appears to have remained so into the spring. In addition, growth in household spending slowed noticeably early in the year, despite solid increases in household income as well as relatively high levels of consumer sentiment and wealth. Fortunately, the first quarter slowdown in household spending appears to have been temporary. Indicators for the second quarter have so far pointed to a sizable rebound. This recovery is a key factor supporting the committee's expectation that overall economic activity will expand at a moderate pace over the next few years. Despite lackluster economic growth, the job market continued to improve early in the year. During the first quarter, job gains averaged nearly 200,000 per month, just a bit slower than last year's pace. And the unemployment rate held near 5%, even though notably more people were actively looking for work. However, more recently, the pace of improvement in the labor market appears to have slowed markedly. Job gains in April and May are estimated to have averaged only about 80,000 per month. And while the unemployment rate fell to 4.7 percent in May, that decline occurred because fewer people reported that they were actively seeking work. A broader measure of unemployment that includes individuals who want and are available to work but have not searched recently, as well as people who are working part-time but would rather work full-time has flattened out. On a more positive note, average hourly earnings increased 2.5% over the past 12 months, a bit faster than in earlier years and a welcome indication that wage growth may finally be picking up. Although recent labor market data have on balance been disappointing, it's important not to overreact to one or two monthly readings. 
the committee continues to expect that the labor market will strengthen further over the next few years. That said, we will be watching the job market carefully. Ongoing economic growth and an improving labor market underpin our inflation outlook. Overall consumer price inflation, as measured by the price index for personal consumption expenditures, was about 1% over the 12 months ending in April, still short of our 2% objective. Much of this shortfall continues to reflect the effects of earlier declines in energy prices and lower prices for imports. Core inflation, which excludes energy and food prices, has been running close to 1.5%. As the transitory influences holding down inflation fade, and as the labor market strengthens further, the committee expects inflation to rise to 2% over the next two to three years. Our inflation outlook also rests importantly on our judgment that longer run inflation expectations remain reasonably well anchored. However, we can't take the stability of longer run inflation expectations for granted. While most survey measures of longer run inflation expectations show little change on balance in recent months, financial market measures of inflation compensation have declined. Movements in these indicators reflect many factors and therefore may not provide an accurate reading on changes in the inflation expectations that are most relevant for wages and prices. Nonetheless, in considering future policy decisions, we will continue to carefully monitor actual and expected progress toward our inflation goal. Let me now turn to the individual economic projections submitted for this meeting by FOMC participants. As always, each participant's projections are conditioned on his or her own view of appropriate monetary policy which in turn depends on each person's assessment of the multitude of factors that shape the outlook. Participants' projections for growth of inflation-adjusted gross domestic product are slightly lower in the near term than the projections made for the March FOMC meeting. The median growth projection now remains at 2% through 2018 in line with its estimated longer run rate. The median projection for the unemployment rate edges down from 4.7% at the end of this year to 4.6% in the next two years, somewhat below the median assessment of the longer run normal unemployment rate. The median path of the unemployment rate is little changed from March. Finally, the median inflation projection stands at 1.4% this year a bit firmer than in March, and then rises to 1.9% next year and 2% in 2018. Returning to monetary policy, as I said, the committee maintained its target range for the federal funds rate. This decision reflects the committee's careful approach in setting monetary policy, particularly in light of the mixed readings on the labor market and economic growth that I have discussed, as well as continuing below target inflation. Proceeding cautiously in raising our interest rate target will allow us to verify that economic growth will return to a moderate pace, that the labor market will strengthen further, and that inflation will continue to make progress toward our 2% objective. Caution is all the more appropriate given that short-term interest rates are still near zero which means that monetary policy can more effectively respond to surprisingly strong inflation pr pressures in the future than to a weakening labor market and falling inflation. Although the financial market stresses that emanated from abroad at the start of this year have eased, vulnerabilities in the global economy remain. In the current environment of sluggish global growth, low inflation, and already very accommodative monetary policy in many advanced economies, investor perceptions of an appetite for risk can change abruptly. 
As our statement notes, we will continue to closely monitor global economic and financial developments. We continue to expect that the evolution of the economy will warrant only gradual increases in the federal funds rate. We expect the rate to remain for some time below levels that are anticipated to prevail in the longer run because headwinds weighing on the economy mean that the interest rate needed to keep the economy operating near its potential is low by historical standards. These headwinds, which include developments abroad, subdued household formation, and meager productivity growth could persist for some time. But if they gradually fade over the next few years, as we expect, then the interest rate required to keep the economy operating at an even keel should move higher as well. This view is consistent with participants' projections of appropriate monetary policy. The median projection for the federal funds rate rises only gradually to 1.5% at the end of next year and 2.5% by the end of 2018 somewhat below its estimated longer run normal level. Although the median federal funds rate at the end of this year is unchanged from March, a number of participants revised down their projections. For 2017 and 2018, the median projection is one quarter to one half percentage point lower than in March, roughly in line with the one quarter percentage point downward revision made to the estimated longer run level of the federal funds rate. As I've noted on previous occasions, participants' projections for the federal funds rate, including the median path, are not a fixed plan for future policy. Policy is not on a preset course. These forecasts represent participants' individual assessments of appropriate policy, given their projections of economic growth, employment, inflation, and other factors. However, the, out, the economic outlook is inherently uncertain, so each participant's assessment of appropriate policy is also necessarily uncertain, especially at longer time horizons and will change in response to changes to the economic outlook and associated risks. Finally, the committee will continue its policy of reinvesting <coughs> proceeds from maturing Treasury securities and principal payments from agency debt and mortgage-backed securities. As highlighted in our policy statement, we anticipate continuing this policy until normalization of the level of the feds, federal funds rate is well underway. Maintaining our sizable holdings of longer term securities should help maintain accommodative financial conditions and should reduce the risk that we might have to lower the federal funds rate to zero in the event of a future large adverse shock. Thank you, I will be happy to take your questions. Sam. Uh, thanks very much. Sam Fleming from the Financial Times. Uh, one of the big uncertainties hanging over markets right now is clearly the vote in the United Kingdom uh, next week. How much of a factor was that in today's uh, decision relative to the questions you've uh, um, elucidated about the domestic jobs uh, numbers and inflation data? And could you talk a little bit about the channels that you think about when you uh, talk about the potential impact of a Brexit on the U.S. economy? Thank you. Well, uh, Brexit, the upcoming UK decision on whether or not to leave the European Union is something we discussed, and I think it's fair to say that it was one of the factors uh, that factored into today's decisions. Clearly, this is a very important decision for the United Kingdom and for Europe. Uh, it is a decision that could have uh, consequences for uh, economic con and financial conditions in global financial markets. Um, if it does so, 
it could have consequences in turn for the U.S. economic outlook that would be a factor in deciding on the appropriate path of policy. So it is certainly one of the uncertainties that um, we discussed and that uh, factored into today's decision. Steve, and then we'll go to Jason. Thank you. Um, the Fed's outlook for rates has come down sharply for 2018 especially, but it's been coming down gradually over time, uh, almost a full percentage point in some cases compared to a year ago. And yet the GDP outlook remains the same. What has happened in, in say just the past quarter to the committee's outlook for rates to bring it down so much for say 2018 where it's now just 2.4% and further from the long run than it was say in the prior uh, estimate that was out there. Has there been a dramatic change in the committee's view on the relationship of GDP to rates? And maybe you could also explain why the Fed has to keep lowering these rates and getting that forecast wrong. So as I mentioned in my opening remarks, there is really a great deal of uncertainty around each individual's assessment of the appropriate level of rates particularly as we go further out in the forecast horizon and when we come to the long term. And I think what we can see in what many um, econometric and other studies show is that the so-called neutral rate, namely the level of the federal funds rate that is consistent with the economy growing roughly a trend and operating near full employment, that rate is quite depressed by historical standards. Many estimates would put it in real or inflation-adjusted terms near zero. Now, um, the path that you see in the dot plot for rates over time is importantly influenced. Uh, there is accommodation, and uh, as we um, achieve our objectives, I think most participants feel that the accommodation in the current stance of policy needs to be gradually removed. But a very important influence in the out years is what will happen to that neutral rate that will just keep the economy operating on an even keel. And I've often in my um, statements and remarks talked about headwinds um, that reflect um, lingering effects of the financial crisis. Um, to the extent that there are headwinds, I think um, many of us expect that these headwinds would gradually diminish over time, and that's a, a reason why you see the upward path for rates. But there are also more long-lasting or persistent factors that may be at work that are holding down um, the longer lo run level of neutral rates. For example, um, slow productivity growth, which is not just a U.S. phenomenon, but a global phenomenon. Uh, you know, obviously there is a lot of uncertainty about what will happen to productivity growth, but uh, productivity growth could stay long for a prolonged time. And we have um, an aging aging societies um, in many parts of the world that could depress this neutral rate. And I think all of us are involved in a process of constantly reevaluating um, where is that neutral rate going. And I think what you see is a, down, a downward shift in that assessment over time, the sense that maybe um, more of what's causing this neutral rate to be low are factors that are not going to be rapidly disappearing, but will be part of the new normal. Now, you still see an assessment that that neutral rate will move up somewhat, but it has been coming down, and I think it continues to, it continues to be marked lower. And, and it is highly uncertain for all of the dots. Hi, I'm Jason Lang with Reuters. Uh, the median participant forecast for the Fed funds rate for 2017 and 2018 uh, came down quite dramatically, but this stands in contrast with the 2016 median forecast. Uh, as you uh, mentioned, there were a number, uh, actually six uh, participants who saw uh, only one rate hike this year. 
uh, can, can you comment on what it would take for two rate increases to be a, the, the uh, uh, likely or appropriate policy path? And about this disconnect between uh, the median view and the view of the, uh, uh, say, the, the voting members of the committee. Well, well, if there is one, I should I should add. Thank well, you. Well, I'm, I'm not going to comment on participants versus voters. Um, you know, monetary policy. The the committee feels that monetary policy, when we're looking at several years. Um, we should show the public what the views are of all the participants in the committee, especially given that voting, uh, ro voting rotates every year, and so that's a decision we made. Um, but you asked me what it would take to have two increases. So, you know, the committee as a whole never discusses how many increases should we have this year or next year, that's not a decision we're making as a committee. We're making decisions on a meeting-by-meeting meeting basis and trying to give a sense to the public of what we're looking for and what the basis of a decision will be. And um, as I indicated, first of all, international uncertainties loom large here. We mentioned uh, Brexit, the UK decision. Obviously, how that turns out um, is something that will factor into future decisions. And we're also looking at the prospects for economic growth and continued progress in the labor market. Um, the, the forecasts that you see in the SCP and the statement indicate the committee continues to expect we will have moderate growth. 2% um, growth you know, suggests healthy growth for the rest of the rest of the year and a pickup in growth uh, in the second quarter. And we expect to see continuing progress in the labor market. Now, we had questions about the growth outlook because we did see slower growth in the fourth quarter and in the first quarter. I have to say there, with respect to the slowdown we saw in consumer spending, that seemed to be out of line with fundamentals. We expected it to pick up, and we've seen very good evidence that it has picked up. But now the labor market appears to have slowed down. And um, we need to assure ourselves that the underlying momentum in the economy has not diminished. So, as I said, we will be carefully assessing data on the labor market to make sure that um, job gains are going to continue at a um, pace sufficient to result in further improvement in the labor market, and we will be watching the spending data to make sure growth is picking up in line with our expectations. Of course, with respect to inflation, um, we're constantly evaluating whether or not incoming information uh, is roughly in line with our expectations. So we will be evaluating that at every meeting. Every meeting is live, and we could make a decision at any meeting to adjust the funds rate, but um, that's the kind of thing that we will want to see to make such decisions. The Fed created a labor market conditions index a couple years ago that was designed to sort of uh, bring together a lot of these factors in the labor market that you've talked about. As I'm sure you know, it's been falling since January. That suggests to some people that it was your decision to raise rates in December that has caused this weakening in the labor market. Could you address what role, if any, you think the Fed's decision to raise rates has played in the slowdown we are now seeing? Well, let me just say the Labor Market Conditions Index is a kind of experimental research prod prod product that's a summary measure of many different indicators. And essentially, that measure um, tries to assess the change in labor market conditions. Um, as I look at it and as that index looks at things, the state of the labor market is still healthy. But there's been something of a loss uh, of momentum. Um, the 200,000 uh, jobs a month we saw, for example, in the first quarter of the year, 
um, that's, that's slowed in recent months. Um, exactly what the reasons are for that slowing, um, it's difficult to say. It may turn out, you know, again, we should never pay too much attention to, for example, one job market report. There's a large error around that. We often see large revisions. Um, we should not overblow the significance of um, one data um, point, especially when other indicators of the labor market are uh, still flashing green. Initial claims for unemployment uh, insurance remain low. Uh, perceptions of the labor market remain uh, fine. Uh, data from the jolts. Uh, on job openings continue to reach new highs. So um, there's a good deal of incoming data that uh, does signal continued pro progress and strength in the labor market. But as I say, it does bear watching. So the committee doesn't feel and doesn't expect, and I don't expect, that labor market progress in the labor market has come to an end. We have tried to make clear to the public and through our actions and through the revisions you see, have seen over time in um, the dot plot that we do not have a fixed plan uh, for raising rates over time. We look at incoming data and are prepared to adjust our views to keep the economy on track. And in light of that data dependence of our policy, I really don't think that a single um, rate increase of 25 basis points in December um, has has any has had much significance for the outlook, uh, and we will continue to adjust our thinking in light of incoming data in whatever direction is appropriate. John, any line? Sure, Jan, I, I want to come back to these longer run rate projections that uh, you've been asked about. So uh, yields on 10-year Treasury notes have fallen below 1.6%. On five-year notes, they're near 1%. Elsewhere in the world, uh, in Germany and Japan, long-term bond yields are negative. Uh, does, how do you explain this low level of long-term bond yields, and does it give you any pause uh, in looking at your own projections and coming to a conclusion about whether those projections are possibly still way too high when the bond market is at a much lower level? So I, I think the levels of longer term rates reflect essentially two things. One is market expectations about the path of short term rates over if we're considering say a 10 year uh, Treasury security, what would be the path of uh, short-term rates over the next 10 years? And the second factor is the so-called term premium or the extra yield that investors demand in order to hold a longer-term security instead of to invest short-term. And clearly, market expectations for the path of short-term interest rates um, over the next 10 years remain, remain low. And that is a factor, that is an important factor that's, I think, holding down the level of longer-term yields. But um, perhaps as important, or maybe even more important, um, the term premium is also low and has probably come down. Now, um, when we engaged in longer term asset purchases, um, our very purpose in doing that was to drive down longer term yields by um, making these assets scarce, scarcer, um, and hence more valuable to the public that wants to invest in long-term securities. And uh, we were consciously attempting to drive down that term premium. Now, we continue to hold a large quantity of those securities, but we're not adding to them. But uh, in many parts of the world, the, the ECB, for example, and the Bank of Japan are also engaging in quantitative easing, buying long-term, 
longer term assets and pushing down those term premia. So I think term premia are very low as well as the expected path of short Did rates. These yield levels give you any uncertainty, any doubt about whether you're going to be able to get rates to where projections say they're going? Well, so I, I want to say again, um, we're quite uncertain about where rates are heading in the longer term. Um, we write down our best estimates at this time of what is a longer run normal level of the federal funds rate. Um, and those are numbers about which there is great uncertainty. As I said, we um, have good reason to believe that the so-called neutral rate or rate compatible with um, the economy operating at full employment um, is low at the present time. And um, many of us believe as a base case, it's reasonable to assume that those rates will move up over time. But we're not certain of that. It is, it's one of the uncertainties that, and there could be revisions in either direction, but um, thus far um, in recent SCPs, I'd say um, the revisions have mainly been, have been in the downward direction. The idea that um, a low neutral rate may be more closer to the new normal, but you still do see some reversion. So um, we're really quite uncertain about that. In your speech in Philadelphia, you called the slowdown in job growth last month concerning, and you mentioned today that you want to verify that the underlying momentum in the economy and in the labor market is still continuing. What do you need to see to convince you that the labor market is still moving toward full employment, and for how long would you need to see it? So I can't give you a formula. I know I know you would probably like to have a number that's a cutoff for what uh, we need to see in a particular report. There are a lot of different um, indicators uh, of the labor market. For example, the labor market conditions index that Binya uh, referred to has 19 different uh, indicators. Um, clearly, we will be looking at the next job report, and um, if we were to see a healthy pace of job growth, um, you know, above that needed to kind of maintain the status quo in the labor market. So, you know, I should say over time we should expect to see as the economy clump comes closer to maximum employment, the likely pace of job gains is um, probably going to slow down somewhat. Um, and we have seen some slowing, but the recent couple of months was very low and are arguably not even at the pace we need to see to maintain stable labor market conditions. So we we'll want to see an adequate pace of um, job creation. There might be revisions to previous months that would change our views, but there will be other surveys of uh, employment intentions and um, other indicators of the labor market that we'll, focus, we'll be focusing on. So um, there is no formula for what it takes, but we will be looking at the labor market. Okay, Peter and then Gina. Oh, did you want to follow up? Sorry, I had a quick follow up. Um, also in your speech in Philadelphia, you did not say that you felt that it would be probably appropriate for a rate hike uh, to occur in the coming months. Um, do you, did you intentionally leave that out? Um, you know, we do need to make sure that there's sufficient momentum. I don't know what the timetable is going to be to gain that assurance. Every meeting is live. There is no... There is no meeting that is off the table, um, that no meeting is out in terms of a possible rate increase. But um, we really need to look at the data, and I can't pre-specify a timetable, so I'm you know, not comfortable to say it's in the next meeting or two, but it could, it could be, it could be. It's not impossible. It's not impossible that by July, for example, we would see um, data that led us to believe that we're in, we're in a perfectly fine course and that data was an aberration and other concerns would have passed. 
Ma'am, Peter, Peter Barnes, Fox Business. Hi. Uh, we are in an election season, and in the past, the Fed has been sensitive to uh, making policy changes in election years. Um, you have three more meetings before the November presidential election. Could you comment on whether or not uh, the election will come into play um, uh, and, and any concern that if you change policy ahead of the election and based on your forecast today, you obviously could, uh, are you concerned that that could then lead to charges that the Fed is trying to change policy to influence the outcome of the election uh, and, and because the Fed has been sensitive to, to that in the past? Thank you. So we are very focused on assessing the economic outlook and making changes that are appropriate um, without taking politics into account. Um, Look, if the data, incoming data, were in the coming months to justify the kind of um, gradual increases that we have long discussed that we see is appropriate uh, in light of the outlook, um, I think markets should not be surprised by such a decision if we make it, and it's obviously um, consistent with the data that we've seen, and uh, the committee will feel free to move in the coming months if we think it's appropriate. Gina. Uh, Gina Smiley, Bloomberg. You mentioned in your remarks at the beginning that we are getting a slightly different signal when you look at inflation versus when you look at inflation expectations. Could you detail a little bit which you look at and sort of weight more? Are you more concerned with the inflation expectations or focusing more on the slight pickup in actual inflation? Well, we're looking at both. Um, you know, I would say with respect to the behavior of inflation, um, Inflation is behaving roughly in the manner I would have expected. I have really not seen significant surprises there. We have long said that an important reason that inflation uh, is as low as it's been is because of past declines in energy prices and uh, increases in the value of the dollar. And as those factors uh, began to dissipate, we would see inflation moving up. Now, that's exactly what we're seeing, what we're, and that's in line with our thinking and with the data. So those things have stabilized. Their influence is dissipating. And with respect to core inflation, which now that's partly influenced also by the dollar, but trying to pull out the dollar and import price influence, um, core inflation seems to be behaving roughly as one would expect with well-anchored inflation expectations and uh, in improving labor markets. So I'm not seeing anything. Inflation, even core inflation, is running under 2 percent. I continue to think the evidence supports um, a projection that it will move up over the next couple of years um, back toward our 2 percent objective. But um, we've seen in the past, and economic theory suggests, that inflation expectations are relevant to price and wage setting decisions. So we do monitor indicators of inflation expectations carefully. Now, it's very hard to know exactly what inflation expectations are relevant to actual price and wage decisions. And uh, so, for example, we've seen the Michigan survey in a measure of household inflation expectations um, move down. Um, it's hard. That's a preliminary number. It's hard to know what to make of it. We've certainly taken note of it. Um, but survey-based uh, measures that um, where forecasters are queried have really all been quite stable. And measures of inflation compensation, I always try to be careful to call it inflation compensation rather than inflation expectations because they're not inflation expectations. Um, inflation expectations influence those market measures, but there's also an inflation risk premium. And there are actually good reasons to think that the inflation risk premium um, could have declined significantly and may be depressing those measures. So we watch them. Um, we've taken note in the statement that they've moved down, but um, it, it, 
actual inflation is behaving more or less as would be expected. Okay. Marty. Uh, Marty Kretzinger with the Associated Press. Uh, when the April minutes were released, uh, they, they uh, caught markets by surprise and in there they show, they seem to show that there was an active discussion of a possible June uh, rate increase, something that we hadn't gotten from the policy statement that was issued right after the meeting. Was that a conscious decision to, to, to hold back and, and tell us in, uh, when the minutes came out about the, the June discussion? And uh, if so, could you tell us what surprises we could see in the June minutes? <laughs> so the minutes are always, um, have to be an accurate discussion of what happened at the meeting. So they're not changed after the fact um, in order to correct possible misconceptions. There was a good deal of discussion uh, at that meeting of um, the possibility of moving in June and that appeared in the minutes. Um, I suppose in the April statement, we gave no obvious um, hint or kind of calendar-based signal that June was um, a possibility. But I think if you look at the statement, we pointed to slower growth, but pointed out that the fundamentals, there was no obvious fundamental reason for growth to have slowed. And we pointed to um, fundamentals underlying uh, household spending decisions that remained on solid ground, suggesting that maybe this was something transitory that um, would disappear. We noted that labor market conditions um, continue to improve in line with our expectations expectations, and um, we did downgrade somewhat our expressions of concern about the global, global risk environment. So I do think that there were hints in the April statement that the committee was um, changing its views of what it was seeing in a direction. We continue to say that we think if um, economic developments evolve in line with our expectations, the gradual and cautious further increases we expect to be appropriate. And um, I suppose I was somewhat surprised with the market interpretation of it, but the June, me June minute, uh, the, the minutes of the April meeting were an accurate um, summary of what, what had happened. Jeremy? Uh, Jeremy Tangeman with the uh, AFP News Agency. Uh, the Fed has uh, repeatedly voiced its concern over the slow pace of uh, wage growth. Uh, I was wondering, do you think that uh, increasing the federal minimum wage could be of any help? Uh, could it boost the higher wages and uh, eventually drive up uh, the inflation? So I think that the minimum wage increases that have gone into effect, um, estimates that um, I've seen uh, suggest it's a relatively minor influence on uh, the aggregate level of wage inflation. Um, I, I would take somewhat faster wage increases to be a sign that labor market slack is diminishing um, and that the labor market is approaching conditions that are consistent with maximum employment. So um, I think, you know, I think we have seen some hints, perhaps preliminary indications that wage growth is picking up. And um, as much as anything, I think it's a sign of a generally healthy labor market, which is um, what our mandated objective is to achieve maximum employment. And so it would be a symptom of it. Okay, Greg, and then Justine. Greg Robb from Market Watch. Um, there's been a lot of discussion in the last couple of months about the slow pace of demand in the global economy. And some economists think that central banks should think about using helicopter money, maybe in Japan first or Europe first. But then uh, former Fed chairman Ben Bernanke weighed in saying that he thought it would be a good thing for the Fed to put helicopter money in its toolkit in case there was a downturn in the United States. So I'd like to get your comments on that. So 
in normal times, I think it's very important that there be a separation between monetary and fiscal policy. And it's a primary reason for independence of the central bank. Um, we have seen all too many examples of countries that end up with high or even hyperinflation because um, those in charge of fiscal policy direct their central bank uh, to help them finance it by printing money. And um, maintaining price stability and low and stable inflation um, is very much aided by having central bank independence. Now, that said, in unusual times where the concern is with very weak growth or possibly deflation, rather rare circumstances, first of all, fiscal policy can be a very important tool. And it's natural that if it can be employed, that just as monetary policy is doing a lot to try to stimulate growth, that fiscal policy should play a role. And normally you would hope in an economy with those severe downside risks, monetary and fiscal policy would not be working at cross purposes to get, but together. Now whether or not in such extreme circumstances there might be a case for, let's say, coordination, close coordination, where the central bank playing a role in financing fiscal policy. This is something that academics are debating, and um, it is something that one might legitimately consider. It was, I would see this as a very abnormal, extreme situation where uh, one needs an all-out attempt, and even, even then it's a matter that academics are debating, but only in an unusual situation. Justine, and then Steve. Justine Underhill, Yahoo Finance. So uh, now that the Fed has started the process of raising rates, uh, various Fed officials have said, including Ben Bernanke, that the Fed could go cash flow negative in this scenario as uh, capital losses are taken on the portfolio of bonds. Do you still see this happening, and when might this happen? So you're talking about our income going negative? Yes. Well, it is conceivable in a scenario when, where growth and inflation really surprise us to the upside, um, that we would have to raise short-term interest rates so rapidly that the rates we would be paying um, on reserves would exceed what we're earning on our portfolio. Now, even then, we have um, about $2 trillion of liabilities, namely currency, on which we pay no interest. So this does require a, an extreme scenario with very rapid increases in short-term interest rates. So. It is conceivable, but quite unlikely that that it could happen. Um, but you know, it, if it were to happen, uh, we would have an economy that would be doing very well. This is probably an economy that everybody would feel um, very pleased was performing well and better than expected. And um, where monetary policy, uh, you know, our goal is price stability and maximum employment, and we would probably feel that we had done very well in achieving that. So um, we usually make money. We've been making a lot of money in recent years, but the goal of monetary policy is um, not to maximize our um, income. And, you know, in a very strong economy like that, um, the Treasury would be seeing a lot of inflows in the form of tax, tax revenues, too. Madam Chair, Steve Beckner of Market News International. Um, to what extent uh, do you feel constrained in raising interest rates by the low or even negative rates uh, that foreign central banks are pursuing, possibly out of concern for what it might mean for the dollar exchange rate? And if that is a constraint, to what extent are you, uh, might you also be concerned about the impact long range 
of low domestic rates on possibly distorting domestic markets. So the state of foreign economies, both their growth outlooks and the stance of monetary policy, those are factors that influence the U.S. outlook and influence the appropriate stance of monetary policy. So, of course, we do look at um, foreign rates, um, the prospects and the prospects for um, growth in those economies in considering the stance of policy. Um, Differentials between countries in um, likely policy paths do tend to spill over into um, exchange rates. That is a standard part of how monetary policy works. And um, a stronger dollar um, does have a, both a depressing effect, it creates channels through which um, Domestic demand is depressed. At the moment, um, net exports, well, for quite some time and probably going forward, they will be somewhat of a drag on U.S. growth. Um, so that's a factor that we take into account. And um, increases in the dollar that we've seen since mid-2014 have served to push inflation down as well. Can also have impacts on commodity prices that are relevant. So it's, it, it is certainly relevant to the stance of U.S. monetary policy and a factor, but when one says a constraint, I really would not go so far as to say it is a constraint on monetary policy. When we have an outlook for continuing above trend growth, that if we held rates absolutely flat, we have reason to believe inflation would overshoot our target, we would see a case to gradually raise rates over time. Um, at the moment, I think markets do expect, and this is factored into market prices, a gradual path for rates to increase over time. But, for example, if we were to see upside surprises to growth and to inflation and had to raise short-term rates faster, thought we should, um, one of the channels by which that would work would be the associated impact on the dollar. That is a standard channel through which the monetary policy transmission mechanism works, and we would take it into account and would not feel constrained, but that would be part of how it would work. And last question will be Nancy. Um, how much do you... Oh, Nancy Marshall Genzer from Marketplace. How much are you watching oil prices and their impact on inflation and how that could affect the timing of future rate increases and how much you might increase rates? Well, oil prices have had many different effects on the economy, and so we've been watching oil prices closely. As you said, um, falling oil prices um, pull down inflation. Now, it takes falling oil prices to lower inflation on a sustained basis. Once they stabilize at whatever level, the, their impact on inflation dissipates over time. So we're beginning to see that happening. Not only have they stabilized, they've moved up some, and their inflation is, their impact on inflation is waning over time. But um, oil prices have also had a very substantial negative effect on drilling and mining activity that's led to weakness in um, investment spending and job loss in manufacturing and obviously in the energy sector. Now, you know, it has different effects in different countries and different sectors. For American households, uh, it's been a boon. We've estimated that since mid-2014, the decline in energy prices and oil prices um, has probably resulted in gains of about $1,400 um, per U.S. household, and that's had an offsetting positive impact on spending. But in many countries around the world that are important commodity exporters, um, 
the decline we've seen in oil prices has had a depressing effect on their growth, um, their trade with us and other trade partners, um, and, and caused problems that have had spillovers to the global economy as well. So it's a complicated picture. Thank you. The chair getting more practiced at her press conference. Michael McKee has attended 432 of these back to Alexander Hamilton. You're not in the Broadway play, are you? No, but I'll, uh, and you didn't have to pay those kind of money to get into that. You don't, you don't. Um, how is this different from Margot Draghi's press conference? It's very much the same. I mean, you don't get a chance to ask a follow-up question, but people are very focused on what policy is going to be and the implications of it. They just don't happen as often as you would like, and that becomes an issue when a meeting like July is on the table. She tried to make that case, yeah. probably not for economic reasons today, but uh, there are people who think they should have these every Well, meeting. let's welcome back our audience. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Good morning to you in Asia, uh, and certainly listening uh, in a very interesting Europe as well. Uh, you're watching and listening to Bloomberg Television and Bloomberg Radio. I'm Tom Keen, of course, with Michael McKee. Uh, and lots to look at. Let's do a quick data check before we get to our esteemed guest. Vice Chairman Blinder is scheduled to join us uh, here uh, in a bit. Quickly to the, uh, the data, and it's the usual setback from the shock and awe of the meeting, but nevertheless, these are changed screens from 145 this afternoon. The two-year yield, 0 0.68 to three digits, 0.678. The 10-year yield comes in, and of course, oil churning. Next screen. <laughs> Excuse me, quickly, Tania. And we'll come to yen here in a moment. The global litmus paper, 105.96. Uh, dollar a little bit weak and two tens uh, steepening out here over the last uh, hour. There's a two year yield again. It's one of the great U.S. Uh, proxies. To fold this together, economics, finance and investment with the global litmus paper, which is foreign exchange, working with James Sweeney at Credit Suisse, is Shahab Jalanus, and we're thrilled that you could join us uh, today. I want to go right to the chart and the look on dollar-yen. For those of you on Bloomberg Radio, I'll put this out on Bloomberg Radio Plus, but it's a chart that many of our viewers and listeners know. Japan acts, Japan wants a weaker yen, and a good part of this strong yen is Chair Yellen. Is Chair Yellen the central banker to the people of Japan? <laughs> well, we'll get to see uh, tonight, I guess, uh, with uh, the outcome of the BOJ's own interest rate meeting. Around one quarter of economists are expecting another policy ease out of Japan. Um, my question would be, what's the point of easing now, uh, ahead of the potential Brexit risk that the markets are facing, potentially seeing a lack of response, or <coughs> the required response from the market, and then eventually you know, potentially then having to ease again, maybe in an emergency right. fashion. So mm -hmm. it's, it's difficult at this point. And Mike, Shab goes directly to the game theory, the complexities. Well, Janet Yellen did note in her news conference that Brexit was a factor in their decision making. They don't know what's going to happen. Is it a factor in a trade right now, uh, the uncertainty surrounding this? Well, if you look at FX option markets right now, um, currencies pretty far away from the UK, they're also pricing in right now quite a lot of implied volatility over the Brexit uh, period. So I think this is really the only issue right now that uh, FX markets are interested <coughs> in now that uh, the Fed is out of the way, with the exception of the Bank of Japan meeting tonight. Well, then the question becomes, uh, which I put to uh, our earlier guests, suppose they vote to stay in the European Union on June 24th, does everybody head for the same door? Potentially, yes. Uh, there's, there's a lot of... Uh, inability in the market at this point to provide an exit um, uh, in terms of hedges for those who are worried about Brexit risk. So presumably, uh, I think market participants may be actually underweight sterling assets in, in a material way, European assets more generally. So a remain outcome could lead to quite a big risk on type environment. Now, of course, it depends on how conclusive the remain outcome is as well. Uh, there's some discussion around the type vote still leading to some risk aversion in the UK. But a clearer win, I think, would lead to that narrow uh, re-entry door. Is your world active now? With the uncertainty that Mike I and mean, Bob Nardelli in the business world talking about uncertainty the other day, is your world busy or are you guys all on the beach of the Hamptons? <laughs> I wish we could be. No, You've got to stay we, through we, Thursday, right, next <laughs> week? Exactly. No, we, we, we're definitely busy, at least in terms of having to focus on the market, having to... Are people taking bets? 
I think it's difficult to take bets per se. I, uh, I certainly believe investors have tried to uh, cover the risk to some extent, um, but actively betting is, is hard because if, for example, you want to bet on Brexit um, right now, it's pretty expensive to do that. For example, if you want to use the options market, the risk premium is so high, it's not very appealing at this point to do anything uh, on that front. So what we are seeing though is market participants try to look at uh, areas where there still might be cheap ways to, uh, to look at uh, putting on, you could call bets on, on uh, Brexit. For example, we believe that uh, implied volatility in the Canadian dollar is too low, you know, given where everything else is. If you get a general market dysfunction, even a currency that's completely unrelated like the Canadian dollar could, could see a lot of volatility. So there are still these uh, possibilities on the sidelines, but not that many given yeah. how high volatility well, is already. Our Eric Schatzker traded his ticket to Hamilton for a seat at Janet Yellen's press conference. He's come out of uh, the meeting now. And Eric, uh, what did you see as the most important thing that she said? Well, there are a number of important things that she said, Michael. We can certainly go through a bunch of them. It took a while for her to get, or at least to answer or address the question that so many people were inevitably asking after reading this statement and looking at the summary of economic projections and that most importantly, the dot plot. Could the Fed actually move any time during the next three months as we get close to the election? And Jenny Enlund was adamant that the Fed will feel free to move if the data warranted. In fact, she said it could be at the next, next meeting or two. And she said, and I quote her again, July isn't impossible. And so she has been saying this consistently, of course, but it's clear that she wants to leave the world with an understanding that the Fed is independent. It's not going to be swayed by politics, even if there is a disorderly market reaction or the risk of a disorderly market reaction to a poorly handled uh, Fed rate hike. And we've well, seen such a disorderly market reaction before. I'm thinking of December, and that continued into January and all the way through to February the 11th. So that was the first thing. Uh, I, I heard you guys talking about Brexit. Obviously, that's a big deal, looming very... She said that the Brexit and other international uncertainties loom very large for the Fed, and most definitely played uh, a role in today's decision to stand pat at 25 basis points. Well, how did she square the idea that uh, the Fed's summary of economic projections sees just a little bit slower growth, but inflation rising and Unemployment staying about where it is, close to full employment, and yet the Fed being on hold and, and lowering its, uh, its forecast for rate increases. Mike, she was asked that question, as you know, a couple of ways, and I don't think you could find anybody in that room who felt that the explanation for that was satisfactory. Whether we're going back to December, whether we're going back even further to see how the Fed has ratcheted down its expectations for what the neutral or normal rate should be, you know, if the economy is uh, operating at full employment, while at the same time, as you point out, cranking down, ratcheting down uh, its expectations for inflation, uh, for unemployment at the same time, but most importantly for economic growth. Uh, I, again, I don't think I'm alone in coming out of that room not feeling as though that question was especially well answered. What do you think? Well, let me ask Shahab Jalanus, because the, the market had to like the fact that the Fed came down in its dot plot towards where the market is, but do you have any better idea of what their reaction function is? What will cause them to raise rates? Well, I think what this shows is the <clears throat> importance of uh, global events, in my view, frankly. Uh, we have very weak growth uh, in the rest of the world outside the U.S. We have negative rates in a substantial part of the uh, sovereign government bond space. Uh, all of this is leading to inflows into U.S. debt markets, uh, that's for sure, from the rest of the world. But I think really, at the end of the day, as, as Janet Yellen said, you have a situation where net trade uh, it has a negative effect on GDP in the U.S., and if the dollar were to surge uh, on the basis of a, of a hawkish Fed, one that's more hawkish than the market's priced in right now, again, then you have a feedback loop back into inflation from that as well. So in my view, it's difficult right now for the Fed to, to be looking to do anything uh, approaching a sequential series of hikes given the global backdrop right now. When I look at this, starting in the Japan Thursday, today's Wednesday, right? Yeah, today's well, it's Thursday. already Thursday. And for you and me, we're not sure. Yeah, but but the surveillance mattress folks, it's down the aisle from where Mike and I sleep. Uh, but seriously, this this is a really important question. We got to open in Japan and then we got to go to Europe. I'm looking at my Bloomberg Shahab and Europe negative rates closed ugly. How will they adapt to this moment as they recalibrate less to Brexit and more to the next Carney and the next Draghi moment? 
I think at the time being, you know, it's hard to look beyond Brexit, for, to be honest with you. There's so much uh, requirement right now to uh, not lose money, you know, if, if the worst Thank happens. Thank you. Brilliantly in the UK. said. So I think that's, that makes it pretty hard, really, to you know, go and look that far out right now. That is a big change for people in the markets because it was easy to make money. <clears throat> Central banks were pumping money into the global economy. They're still doing it, but now you say the goal is just don't lose? I think so because uh, it's very difficult to calibrate <clears throat> just what will happen to markets or would happen to markets in, in a Brexit outcome. Um, but markets are defensive. You're not paid a tremendous amount of yield to take risk at this point in time. We, we know <clears throat> that much. Um, so why do it? You know, why look to, to take on aggressive positions ahead of an event with very difficult to, to analyze tail risk potentially? I think that's what's put the market in this defensive mode we have right now. Uh, and if you add, overlay that, uh, well, onto that, the current stance of central banks, which is really telling markets that things aren't good. Um, then why, yeah. again, it just it dissuades you from wanting to take aggressive action. Eric Shasker, very quickly here, there, I was surprised at the amount of talk on the labor economy in 60 days of lousy labor numbers. What was the energy in the press conference about the blunt instrument of sub-100,000 non-farm payrolls? Well, there was a lot of, it's, Tom, I'm sure you heard, there were a lot of questions about the pace yeah, of job Gina growth. Smilak, and what Jenna among others. Of course, would have to see to justify uh, a rate increase, the question, Mike, that you just asked moments ago. And she said on more than one occasion that you have to look beyond one data point. She, can't, she said, in fact, you can't overblow one data point and you have to look beyond a single job report. And clearly the Fed has been disappointed by the slowdown in the pace of job creation. Uh, and that is the one thing. I mean, if you had to... If you had to isolate one thing that Janet Yellen seems most concerned about or is monitoring most closely, it's the labor market, more so than inflation. In fact, she tamped down these concerns about uh, deteriorating inflation compensation, which is how she describes things like tips, for example, or break-evens, as opposed to survey-based expectations. She also did, though, give us a couple of other clues about what it would take for the Fed to want to raise rates. She talked about the headwinds. We've gone into a bunch of detail already about one of them, which is international or external developments. But the other two, I thought worth pointing out, because I hadn't heard her say this before, at least not recently, were subdued household formation and thirdly, meager productivity growth. So those are things that the Fed considers headwinds. And clearly, if there were progress in the economy on either of those two fronts, she, I think it stands to reason, she believes right. it would flow through, right, to job creation, it would flow through to wage growth, and ultimately, uh, we would see it uh, in the form of higher inflation. Eric Shatsker, thank you so much. Eric Shatsker in Washington uh, at today's press conference. Uh, again, focused on moving to uh, July as well. I think I'm going to do a data check here very quickly, Mike, on the, the yield market and what we saw with the gyrations and wondering where we'll be when we start in tomorrow morning. Two-year yield, 0.68%. The 10-year, under a 160, bobbing around, but still lower yields off of this call. Uh, and then I would move as well to dollar-yen, which is a 106 moments ago. And the idea of 10604, Michael. Well, let's look at the uh, two-year yield here because what we're seeing is a yield curve steepening a little bit. The two-year falling more than the 10-year as people take the Fed out of the market for the next at least uh, well, it looks like three to six months or so. <clears throat> a must-read book, Michael. A number of years ago, I think over a decade ago, was the work of Alan Blinder of Princeton University. He is the former Fed vice chairman. You know him from his recent wonderful book on the crisis. But what I remember, Professor Blinder, is a quiet revolution talking about central banking going modern. How modern is this central bank? Are they working out of your core textbook? Or is everything we heard today absolutely original in a very loud revolution? Well, I don't know if it's completely original, but I think it's very modern. I mean, one of the great hallmarks of modern central banking as opposed to older, and I don't mean archaic, I mean only a few decades ago, central banking is central bank talk about communication with the public. I mean, there she was, as Ben Bernanke was before her, but as Alan Greenspan never was, <laughs> doing a press conference to explain the Fed's uh, thinking. I mean, Alan Greenspan would have thought, and again, he was Fed chairman not that long ago. That was completely unthinkable. And now it's just normal. 
Well, what did, what did you learn today about the Fed's reaction function? Do you have any idea what would lead them to raise rates or even why they would consider it given their economic outlook? Uh, I think so, and I think you do too, actually. It's a further tightening of the labor market that starts to show evidence of <laughs> inflationary uh, pressures. And, you know, if you want to look at it, it was interesting to me, by the way, that Esther George didn't dissent from this uh, decision, because if you want to look at the data in a certain way, you can see signs of that. For example, uh, we see that the unemployment rate is just slightly below the Fed's estimate of Nehru. And we see both wages and prices accelerating, though from very low levels. They're not at levels that scare anybody uh, right now. But they're moving up, not down. And if you're sufficiently hawkish, that would be, um, those would be powerful signals to start getting on with the job of normalizing interest rates. But the Fed didn't think that way. Uh, today. Well, did you buy the idea that the Fed is going to overshoot? I mean, you look at the economic projections they put out, and they see inflation rising, but the unemployment rate over the next two years falling even further than they had yeah. before. Yeah, that's the kind of thing I mean. They're forecasting inflation below Nehru, which is consistent with rising inflation. Don't forget, Mike, that they've been telling us for a long time that they're willing to tolerate somewhat of an overshoot of inflation. They didn't actually put a number on that, but a lot of people speculated that meant two and a half percent instead of two or something like that. But, but anyway, in, in principle, in, the principle is the important thing, that they've been very forthright about uh, some willingness to overshoot inflation. Do you think they can get there? Oh, I do think they can get there. You know, one of the things that seems to have quietly happened that nobody's noticed is that very, very recently, I'm talking about the last couple of months, uh, inflation has basically hit the Fed's target. They're basically there now, but it's rising. So it looks to me like we're going to get uh, an overshoot in the not very distant future. Not a giant overshoot, but an overshoot. We will get an overshoot, but the milieu here, and this links in again, Professor Blinder, with your work of linking finance into economics, we do it within a massive distortion of interest rates. I guess if the Fed extends, and as Neil Dutta says, they lengthen and strengthen, maybe it's lower for longer, do the banks of the world can they have the patience and the time to wait for the Fed to move? Or are they going to run out of degrees of freedom? I guess put simpler, is Deutsche Bank going to run out of degrees of freedom? Um, I don't think so. First, to your, to your point, to your question, Tom, they don't have any choice but to wait. They may wish for a higher interest rate environment, by the way, also in Europe, but they're not getting it quickly. Um, can they ho so the question is, what can they do about it? Can they hold out? This is squeezing bank profits more so in Europe than in the United States, right. uh, by the way. But, you know, businesses have flush times and they have lean times, and they're just going to have to live through the lean times. Not unimportantly in that regard, when you look at U.S. banks, I mean, you raised Deutsche Bank and there are other European banks you might have mentioned. When you look at U.S. banks, they're doing pretty nicely right now in terms of profitability. So they're not suffering very much. I mean, they'd be better off if interest rates were higher. Right. But they don't have to be suffering severely from the low interest rate environment. Have you, with your staff, calculated a terminal value for the American economy? John Herman is not, it, 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 uh, Mitsubishi is way below 2% with a new terminal value. You mean, Do you need to be you that mean a terminal gloomy? growth? Terminal you growth mean a terminal value, growth rate. potential GDP, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. You know, I, I, I'm sorry, I get a quality seat, Professor Blinder. But the basic <laughs> idea, the basic idea, is this a new America, a sub two percent America? Yeah. I noted with interest that the Fed has stuck to its two percent GDP growth rate in the longer run column on the uh, on the projections. Uh, they've come down a bit over the last few years, but I don't think enough. I mean, the, the main part of that growth rate is productivity yep. growth, not population mm -hmm. growth. Our population, our labor force growing slowly, and everybody knows that. Uh, that kind of a number is consistent with roughly a 1.7% uh, annual productivity growth rate. 
Uh, in the last five years, as you know, we've been doing one half of 1% productivity growth rate. So I don't know what the future is going to bring, neither does Janet Yellen or the FOMC. But to me, an assumption that relatively soon we're going to see productivity growing at 1.7% per annum looks quite aggressive to me. I'd be much lower than Sh that. Shahab Jelanus is still with us from Credit Suisse. Uh, you heard Dr. Blinder say that the Fed is about there on inflation. But take a look at inflation expectations. We have a chart both that shows consumers and Wall Street's view. They don't, they're not going in that direction. We'll put this out on Blue, uh, Bloomberg Radio Plus app for uh, everybody to look at. But uh, the market still doesn't believe that. That's right. The markets, I think, um, is more willing, in my view, to look at global developments uh, and take signals from what's going on in Japan, what's going on in the Euro area, the potential risks from China, uh, as factors that also need to be considered when we look at the U.S. economy. Um, in my view, uh, a lot of times when we look at the U.S. economy, we do it from a U.S.-centric perspective, which has historically been the right way to do it, I guess. Um, I think the way markets are unfolding and the economy is unfolding more broadly, that's changing. Uh, and I think markets may be giving us a leading indicator of where the economics profession uh, that looks at the U.S. economy will be going as well going forward. So you see global developments still bringing deflation, disinflation into the United States? For the time being, that's definitely the signal the markets are, are giving us right now. There's obviously uh, a lot of difficulty for uh, market observers to try to see what's really going on in China, what's really going on um, in Europe. It's not uh, something that uh, is very transparent. But what we do know is that uh, the market periodically has large hiccups with, uh, in relation to those issues. And many of the problems that, uh, that they pose have not gone away at all. Um, for example, let's imagine you get a Brexit outcome in the UK. What then happens to the right. your economy? These are, these are issues that are by no means solved. Um, and it's difficult for me to imagine that they'll, they'll become inconsequential going mm -hmm. forward. We, I, I can't right. see as how going back only looking at US data anytime soon. Vice Chairman Blinder, you've been a supporter of Democratic Party politics, your strong support of John Kerry and another time and place. Have you spoken to Secretary Clinton and specifically, have you spoken to Secretary Clinton about a renewed fiscal policy? I have not. I haven't spoken to her at all recently. She's been a pretty busy uh, a person. Busy. Camp Campaigning. These are the kinds of things you talk about uh, after a campaign uh, is over. We might need it. It's possible. My best guess now is that we won't, but uh, I don't hold that guess with a great deal of confidence. Uh, that could be wrong, and we may need a fiscal stimulus. Uh, down the road. Whether we can get one through Congress is another question entirely and will depend, among other things, on the outcome of the election. Well, you heard... Uh, if I could just add... Go no, ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to add to the last point. Uh, I think there's a sense in which the markets on this globalization business have gotten a little bit too modern. Uh, yes, we are influenced by Japan and China and Europe and so on, but Exchange rates are floating, and that leaves a lot of room for divergences in inflation rates, say, in the U.S. versus uh, Europe. So I don't put a lot of weight in projecting U.S. inflation on the inflation rate in Europe or Japan, for example. You're uh, the very uh, figure of a very modern is, major, major general here. <laughs> Excuse me, Mike. Is, is Ch Vice Chairman Blinder, is he cratering the market right now? Is this the Blinder effect? <laughs> well, he was trying to be optimistic, I think. Uh, uh, Look at much that. Much more so than uh, Shahab. Uh, uh, you know, maybe everybody's I don't think I have that pressing. power anymore. You don't have that power anymore. You did for a while here. Push against, uh, Vice Chairman Blinder, if you would. Push against, with, as you do with great respect, the economics of, say, Alan Meltzer, of Carnegie Mellon, and others who say right now, let the market take care of themselves. I mean, the basic idea is a more locky, leave the markets alone, everything will be fine. Where are you on that meter right now? Do well, we need to be intrusive or not? I think if you're, talk you're talking about monetary policy. Yes. I think we need, I think we need or at least should, be informative. That is, markets in the past often flew off on tangents, making extrapolations uh, about what they thought the Fed 
was going to do that had that were very poorly moored in reality. It is much harder to do that now. The markets can't get exactly where the Fed funds rate's going to be a year from now. The Fed doesn't know that either. But the possibilities that beliefs in the markets become totally unhinged from Federal Reserve reality are severely diminished by the greater communicativeness uh, coming out of the Fed. I'll give you an example. Back in the day, when I was vice chairman of the Fed, it was a long time ago, and this was when the Fed was very, very quiet uh, and said nothing about its forward intentions. There was a period of time, I remember this very well, that I was aggravated that the markets thought the Fed funds rate was going to uh, 8%. And most of us inside the building thought it was unlikely to go higher than 6%. But we said nothing officially to bring the market's expectations down. Eventually, of course, they did come down, and the rate in that cycle did top out at 6%. Uh, percent. But we just let that misconception sit there for months and months. The Fed doesn't do that anymore. No, they give us explicit guidance, or That's at least amazing. reasonably explicit guidance. And I'm wondering, Alan, and I'll ask you both, uh, does forward guidance work at this point? Is the dot plot useful if, as uh, Dr. Blinder, you say, the Fed can't know what's going to happen? And if, as Shahab, you say, we don't know what's going to happen with all of these global developments that keep popping up? Alan, I'll let you answer first. I think it's very useful. Now, but that doesn't mean dispositive and controlling. The market has looked at past history, correctly seen that the Fed has overestimated the strength of the economy, implicitly overestimating where interest rates would be in the future, and it's been expressing, and it still is, disbelief in that forecast. That's fine. What you'd like the markets to do is process a lot of information, including what comes out of the Federal Reserve, and make its own judgments. That's what people get paid to do, and that's fine. So I think it's good. Do you think it is helpful? I think it's, it's certainly useful in terms of setting a, a framework for the market to, to look at events going forward. Having said that, um, it's, it's interesting to me that, for example, the Fed can talk about issues like China, like Brexit, issues that clearly nobody really has a firm handle on in terms of what type of uh, reaction they would elicit in the market or, or the wider economy, um, and yet still have dot plots that are so much higher than where the market is. Because the market is giving information, I believe, to policymakers as well, in as much as it's telling policymakers that, that potentially those tail risks do have very severe effects. Um, and I think this mm -hmm. persistent gap between the market and, 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 the, uh, and the policymakers does raise some questions. Thank we you. thank you for joining us on Bloomberg Television and Bloomberg Radio. Shab Jalan is with us from Credit Suisse and Alan Blinder of Princeton. Professor Blinder, we showed this chart with Professor Clarita earlier of Columbia and now PIMCO, and we did this in honor of Rudy Dornbush. The basic idea of Blinder and Clarita looking at the overshoot of Rudiger Dornbush of MIT of many years ago. You mentioned this earlier, Vice Chairman, the idea of a Fed that will overshoot. This goes back to the courage of Olivier Blanchard at the IMF, I'm going to say six years ago, that we need to reflate. In your reading of ec economics, can you reflate a society? Is there any evidence that Draghi, Yellen, Kuroda, Bernanke, for that matter, can they reflate a, a, an economy? There's lots of evidence from the past, but in those past episodes, uh, the central banks rarely, if ever, faced the effect. We used to call it the zero lower bound on interest rates. Now we know we can go negative, and the term of art these days is the effective lower bound on interest rates. In these past episodes of reflation, uh, the effective lower bound was almost never a factor. It, we just weren't anywhere near it, and therefore it wasn't an effective constraint. With the effective lower bound, the uh, central bank is constrained to weaker instruments, as we now know. And we also now know that it takes, uh, to use a technical term, a hell of a lot of quantitative easing to be the equivalent of one percentage point change in the overnight um, interest rates. So 
And that's where the Fed wound up and the ECB wound up and the Bank of Japan wound up. And that means they have less power in the current sort of circumstances to reflate an economy than they're used mm -hmm. to and that they've been accustomed historically to have. Well, Shahab, let me ask you, um, where do we go from here? Suppose, I mean, obviously, if the sky falls, if the British vote to move out and the markets all fall apart, that's one thing. But suppose they vote to stay in as the betting markets have it. The Fed is now on hold from here until probably December. What's the trade? Where do we go? Well, interestingly, you know, despite the negative views that I've put forward uh, in terms of how uh, the broader global economy is going, on a tactical basis, at that point, I suggest uh, looking again at getting back yeah. into risk, especially in Europe, uh, if the UK decides to remain. But also, the market quite quickly could move back to thinking the Fed will talk up again the possibility uh, of maybe more See, than one. You don't account. believe them when they put out a statement like this, or well, how, your, your operational framework is a week or two. Well, this is the funny thing. It's, it kind of is, yes, because what you find is that the Fed doesn't appear to like the market pricing in very low probabilities of, of further rate well, ups, given its message. So <clears throat> it does try to take advantage of times when it can do to, to lift those expectations. Shab Jalanus, thank you so much for Credit Suisse. And Alan Blinder, a special thanks to you on this afternoon. Greatly appreciate your perspective. Uh, Professor Blinder is a former vice chairman of the Federal Reserve um, System. Mike, I think we should do a quick data check here with equities turning south. Of course, we'll continue our coverage on Bloomberg Radio and Bloomberg Television through the afternoon, negative 42 in the Dow. I don't want to overplay that, but what I would say is it's unique to stocks is a 10-year mic is stuck in a 158. Mike, give me your thoughts. Utility's really hurting. Well, I want to go back to the dots chart as we leave here. Yeah. We can call up the dots chart, and you, maybe you the fun the game, the fun game to play is who's Debbie Downer on the dot chart? Because out in 2017 and 2018, there is one member who thinks we're not going to see any rate increases. So this is going to be the parlor game for everybody on trading desks and in economic shops. Who's the real pessimist out there? Well, the, the real pessimist out there, and, you know, it was a joke with Contra Lakota. He's got, well, it was a, he, he, he believed is, that should be the policy, not that he thought Would it you suggest that the happen. former president of the Minneapolis Fed was three months or six months out in front of everybody else? Well, he may have Maybe been. Maybe that's the headline today. Dr. Kochula, paging Dr. Kochula Lakota. Um, but it'll be interesting to see who that was, and uh, we're going to hear some, uh, uh, we'll hear a lot of comments. I, I, I want to say weeks. quickly, All Mike, right. Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television into Asia will be most interesting. And that's what you get next. We're going to uh, wrap up our special program, The Fed Decides, taking stock next on Bloomberg Radio. What did you miss? Coming up on Bloomberg Television, I'm Michael McKee for Tom Key. <clears throat>
We're moments away from the closing bell. I'm Scarlett Fu. I'm Jill Weisenthal. And I'm Lou Kawa. Alex Steele is on assignment. Stocks closing lower this afternoon. Treasury yields and the dollar extending declines. But the question is, what'd you miss? The Federal Reserve skips a June rate increase as policymakers ratchet down their outlook with a sizable minority now predicting only one rate hike this year. Plus, we look ahead to the next central bank decision when the Bank of Japan announces its policy decision. And frontier market no more. MSCI upgrades Pakistan to emerging market status and stocks there jump the most in a year. We begin with our market minutes after the Federal Reserve decided to leave interest rates unchanged.